Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the first live masterclass of the Media Civics Lab Fact Checking Academy, a program by Break the Fake Movement in partnership with Internews. My name is Gab Leones. I am the founder and president of Break the Fake Movement, an independent alliance of young professionals promoting media and information literacy and debunking disinformation across the Southeast Asian region. Now, before we start our program this afternoon, I would like to Welcome, first and foremost, everybody to the Academy, all of you here in our Zoom meeting room, participants, partners, and speakers. We hope you're having a great day today, wherever you are in the Philippines. Now sit down, relax, as today we're going to learn and enjoy our conversations with our speakers. In today's session, we're going to talk about responsible digital citizenship. Going digital means becoming part of an online community. Actually, you're all part of an online community right now. But just because you're part of an online community doesn't really mean you're positively contributing to the conversations online. So there are a lot of tenets of responsible digital citizenship. We can talk about digital learning, digital well-being, avoiding scams, online safety, and what have you. And to give us a full-length discussion on responsible digital citizenship for our first live masterclass of this fact-checking academy, we have our first resource speaker for today, who is a resident trainer of the Facebook Digital Tayo program. So let me introduce him. Char Amazona has an extensive background in Filipino youth engagement and development spanning a total of nine years, where he is widely seen as one of the active champions for genuine reform in politics, good governance, and development in the grassroots. Since 2013, he has been a strong advocate of youth participation and inclusion in different governance, and development initiatives. He's held various positions from different national and local organizations, particularly as the 11th NYP or National Youth Parliament President, among others. Now he's currently the training and marketing officer of AHA Behavioral Design for Meta Philippines Digital Tire Program and has been engaged in various digital literacy sessions across the, con the country. As a multi-hyphenated millennial, Chard champions the value of actively building spaces for Filipino youth in critical and crucial participation in politics, governance, and development in a country to shed light on responsible digital citizenship. Let's all welcome Mr. Char Amazona. Hey, Gab. Hello. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. And of course, I hope that everyone is also um, energized as, as we start our discussion for today. And we believe no, that uh, since this is your first master class, I hope that you will have a lot of questions, especially when we talk about digital citizenship. And with that, no, um, let's start with the session rules. No, uh, basically for this afternoon, the goal is to be a digital citizenship plus, meaning you have to be a responsible digital citizen. It has to be a semblance of empowerment for all of us because I know you are considered to be influencers. You are considered to be content creators and you have the responsibility to champion digital citizenship. So why it is plus? Plus because there is an added value for you. You have the responsibility to make sure that once you hear a lot of concepts this afternoon, you have to practice it. You have to make sure that you will be the one to champion it, especially with your respective communities in so far as digital engagement and empowerment is concerned. So just to have a good idea of what we are really talking about for this afternoon, we have three things. Though. Number one, we will be, of course, um, sharing some thoughts and ideas with respect to digital citizenship. We will deep dive. We will understand better ano ba yung mga concepts of digital citizenship. Next point, of course, is to deep dive on the different domains of digital citizenship. It has to be a way that you can also relate with respect to what is expected from you uh, in so far as this masterclass is concerned. And the last point is, of course, championing digital citizenship in the ASEAN, meaning here in the Philippines, you have the core responsibility to be the advocates of digital citizenship. So if you guys are ready, um, Patayt naman sa ano sa sa chat box natin hashtag #bjzen. I'll start it. Para at least you have also a copy. No, this will be our initial hashtag for this afternoon #bjzen. So that's the goal of our discussion. So thank you, uh, Renzel, 
Thank you to Ramon. Thank you to Rowana. All right. So let's proceed. For the rules this afternoon, um, this will be an interactive session. So we want to make sure that all of you will be able to participate. And I hope that you will be able to also use different um, devices if you have extra. But if not, you can also join through your respective laptops or mobile phones. Second point, there will be live poll questions or Q&A and online quiz and some aspects of the topics. So I hope that you will be able to answer some of them because there's actually a nugget of wisdom on those kinds of contents and topics. And the third point is that this session is actually a safe space for all of us. So if you have some questions, if you have some clarification, if you have um, concerns, in so far as the session is concerned, just let us know. So let's start with our digits and check up. So the goal now is to proceed with um, this point. No, You can just double check with slido.com slash, uh, or sorry, you can enter the code via hashtag Digizen Plus. So just proceed to slido.com. And of course, um, you can take that as part of our discussion points. So Patpadingin naman ng thumbs up kung naka-open na kayo with the slido.com para makita natin kung sino-sino na yung part ng team. So there will be some questions that will be posted here as part of the dis discussion natin. No? Ayan, so may mga nag-thumbs up na. Alright, so if you guys are ready, there are some questions that I'll be sharing with you. So let's start. So how are you feeling today? I want to see a lot of um ideas right now. Kamusta kayo? So you can enter your answers and the question provided. How are you feeling today? Energized? Bakit may hungry? May hindi mo ba nagla-lunch dyan? Good? Meron pa ba? So we are around like, ano, um, 60, 60 plus here. So good, great, curious, calm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Meron pa ba bang hahabol? Two participants are typing. So happy, good, hungry, curious, great. Okay. Ibig sabihin, kaya malaki siya kasi great is one or one of the words being used by a lot of participants this afternoon. So, meron pa mga habol? Going once? Going twice? All right. So, great is a good um, description for today. So, thank you very much. Next question. So, what do you expect in this session? Do you have any idea or any questions beforehand that will answer, you know, uh, we will answer later on in this session. So, meron ba kayong mga ini-expect or anything that you would like to ask beforehand before we proceed with our discussion? So again, for just for those who just came in in this session, no, you can just um enter our slido.com. That just proceed there. You can scan the QR code or, and of course, enter our hashtag Digizen Plus code. All right. So something new on how to be a good digital citizen. Learnings. Who do we consider digital citizens? To learn more on how to be a responsible digizen, acquire new knowledge and skills. Learn about the role of fact-checking skills in digital citizenship. Thank you. Thank you for, for those who contributed to their answers. May mga pumapasok pa. Um, learning about digital content and responsibility. That's right. Digital citizens versus digital migrants. To be part of like-minded people, learn and apply. Learn new skills to be a responsible digital citizen. Updated and relevant discussion on digital stuff. Ayan. Sige. So, um, those actually are... Some of the questions we will be answering later on, uh, siguro I would just like to provide you context. No, In terms of digital migrants, we might touch that topic, but not on deep diving on that uh, concern. Because the goal of our discussion is more on the basic. Since this is a masterclass, you have to be aware of the different foundations on digital citizenship. And you have to be ready in terms of self-improving, no? How can you promote digital citizenship and while learning new, uh, new skill set as part of the process? So having said that, in this quick question, no, I would like to ask the body, how confident are you in discussing digital citizenship? So one is being the lowest and five is being the highest. Okay, so 50, 25, na babago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, sige, tingnan natin. For, for the content creators in this session, Tingnan natin kung ano ba yung total score ng buong community. So, 44% at number 4, 47%. Alright, pero pa bang hahabol? Merong 20 participants. Asan yung iba? So, 20, 22 participants joined the poll. 23. Meron pa bang hahabol? Going months? 
Going twice? Going thrice? All right. So, based on the 24 respondents or 25 respondents, so the total score, 27, may humahabol, sige. The total score, more or less, uh, for this group is that you are currently at between 3 and 4, meaning 3.5. Um, you are somewhat confident in discussing digital citizenship. And I guess that the discussion for the discussion for this um session will also allow you to expand your horizon in so far as digital citizenship is concerned. And thank you very much for the 27 audience who answered our poll for this afternoon. So bakit ko ba siya tinatanong? Bakit ba importante malaman natin um itong confidence level niyo? Because after the session we wanted to make sure that you will be at the level of 4 and 5. Meaning, kailangan mag 4.5 tayo right after the session para at least ready na kayo no, to face a lot of questions about digital citizenship. Now, in terms of the objectives of the session, three points. First point, we will be dealing with definition of the digital citizenship and how it can actually relate to 21st century engagement. Second point is we will be deep diving in the different domains of digital citizenship. We will be introduced to the framework of TBA thinking, being, and acting online. And third point is we will be sharing some thoughts and ideas in so far as ideating and prototyping different digital citizenship learning activities for you as content creators and influencers. So now let's start with the discussion on the first module, which is understanding digital citizenship. So there are a lot of definitions of digital citizenship. And basically, Different groups, different companies, different organizations have different perspectives in so far as digital citizenship is concerned. But for the for the reference, no, uh, for this session, we will be defining digital citizenship as the continuously developing norms of appropriate, responsible, and empowered technology use. So, ano ba yung ibig sabihin natin dito when we talk about those kinds of things? What are the keywords that we have to double check? Number one, developing norms. No, developing norms means that we are creating rules of engagement. This is basically based on the different morals and values that we inculcate, no, or somehow we promote as part of the digital community. Second point is also focused on providing appropriate, meaning it has to follow certain standards. It has to be acceptable. If you are reading a lot of terms and conditions and using different applications or platforms, you will see terms and conditions. So in digital citizenship, there has to be an appropriate conditions when we talk about the concept. Second point, or third point rather, is to provide responsible, meaning as content creators and influencers, it is our responsibility, your responsibility, to be at the core or to be at the forefront of promoting digital citizenship. Why? Because you have an added premium, meaning there's always expectation from you that you are actually responsible and so far as promoting digital citizenship and community is concerned. And last point no, um, is that it has to be an empowered setup, meaning it's not a work wherein only one person understands something. It has to be a collaborative effort for all of the users, for all of the uh, persons or even entities using digital community as a platform. And to sum it up all, it has to be through the use of technology. So just to dissect the whole discussion on digital citizenship, we have to double check two things. Number one, it is a norm. It creates rules of engagement. It creates certain standards that we have to follow. And second point is that it has to be appropriate, responsible, and empowering in so far as technology use is concerned. So how do we double check? How do we uh, create a certain landscape in so far as digital citizenship is concerned? So let me provide to you um, three different definitions and perspectives in so far as digital citizenship is concerned. So according to Ribble and Bailey in 2007, they actually defined digital citizenship as an online display of behaviors that ensure legal, safe, ethical, and responsible use of information and communications technologies. Just to share with you quick trivia, no? digital citizenship or the digital engagement actually started way, way back. Uh, if you're familiar with the idea of uh, Web 2.0, 
no? The, the inclusion of social media as part of the discussion in everyday lives, as part of the development. And the theories that actually provide in, in that perspective is that there is a community no? uh, that we exchange ideas and conversations based on different platforms that we subscribe to. So, yun yung pinaka kailangan yung matandaan as part of the theory and discussions on digital citizenship. Second point, uh, according to Alberta Education in 2012, they were able to define further what do we mean by digital citizenship. For, for them, there has to be a member of a social, political, or national community. It's a citizenship wherein one takes place within a community and it has different rights and responsibilities. So, the idea of digital citizenship does not necessarily fall from the idea of citizenship per se. While in the legal parlance, there has to be a difference in terms of citizenship, like for example, in the United States, citizenship in Singapore, citizenship in Philippines versus citizenship in Malaysia, Indonesia, and whatnot. Uh, but in digital citizenship, the idea, according to Alberta Education, is that Citizenship also, or digital citizenship, follows the same framework in so far as citizenship is concerned. But there is a separate thin line separating citizenship from digital citizenship, because in citizenship somehow there are different principles. Like you follow the the blood principle. Uh, if your mother and father is a Filipino, you're a Filipino, something like that. Or if you're a father, if your father is a Filipino and your mother is a foreigner, um, what citizenship are you? But in digital citizenship, uh, the, the thin line that's separating that perspective or definition is that we are all engaged in an online community. There is technology use, no? in so far as defining that quote-unquote digital citizenship. And the last and the recent dictionary definition from the Turkish dictionary based on different uh, development papers and peer-reviewed comments, digital citizenship is the state of being born, growing up, or having lived in a country. So, any more keywords? No? Um, legal, safe, ethical, and responsible use of technologies. There has to be some rights and responsibilities of certain citizens or citizens within a community, and that it has to be a place where one is born, growing up, and or living through the use of technology. So how can we contextualize more in so far as digital citizenship is concerned? So there, there's actually two important thoughts that I would like to impart as part of the discussion. Number one is as a bridge to empowerment and number two, as a catalyst of engagement. Let's discuss further. When we talk about digital citizenship as an a bridge, no, as bridge for empowerment, this is actually um, a thought or idea produced or introduced by Manzuli, Sanchez, and Bedoya in 2019. And they provided that digital citizenship refers to values of respect, tolerance, liberty, and security, and emphasizes the democratic principles, ethics, legality, security, and responsibility that guide actions in digital spaces. So digital citizenship as a bridge to empowerment it values life, liberty, security, and respect. No, in so far as in the Philippine context, we can consider it as part of the preamble. No, or the the value of the rights of every Filipinos. No, um, to protect and respect life, liberty, and property. No, we can also relate it to that concept. Another thought about digital citizenship being a bridge to empowerment is that. According to Season Hancock, Sohel, and Shefford uh, in 2015, they were able to generate the idea that digital citizenship is a comprehensive concept based on, number one, constant questioning of the policies of all nations, meaning if we have United Nations, then there has to be certain policies that will govern digital citizenship. Second point is that there has to be an active interest in the affairs of different countries or other countries in so far as the ASEAN is concerned, how can the whole ASEAN be able to create a responsible digital community? Or in the Philippines, how can we create a more structured and a more centralized or if not a more empowered digital community? And third point is actually there's an interest in creating a just global order. No? Um, when we talk about just global order, it only means that there has to be rules of engagement, meaning there has to be rules to follow. How can we engage? How can we protect? 
How can we activate? Those are the, the key words that we have to check as part of the discussion points. Another thought that I would like to share as well in so far as digital citizenship bridging to empowerment, no? uh, that there has to be a use of technology uh, through the interpersonal relationships and social practices generated by different social groups. For example, there has to be a certain level of rules of engagement when we talk about content creators and uh, influencers. No, yung, yung, yung policy question now is, is there an ethical way of creating content? Or content is content creation part? Or does it follow rules that will promote fact-checking, that will promote and protect responsible digital community? Or does influencer marketing or influencer activities can create a new landscape of respect, empathy building, and digital wellness. So those are the questions that you have to consider in so far as digital citizenship is concerned related to empowerment. The fourth point is about self-enactment of people's role in society through the use of digital technologies. As we all know, there are a lot of live streaming applications. There are a lot of social media applications. There are a lot of um, different online games and activities that you can share. I mean, just recently, you know, um, there's a big company who launched its live streaming application wherein we can watch a lot of um, childhood movies that we are anticipating or expecting or even, you know, um, watching when we are kids, something like that. And when we talk about digital citizenship as a way to bridge empowerment, there has to be a society, there has to be people that will govern and protect and even promote the value of digital citizenship. So those are the concepts that I would like to impart as part of the discussion point, which also now leads to the second point of the bigger understanding of digital citizenship. So let me share to you um, this thought. No, According to SIMSEC and SIMSEC in 2013, and of course, correlated or if not supported by the study from Aria and Ribeiro, they provided that digital citizenship promotes contemporary litera literacy skills meaning it has to have technical and social skills and there has to be three important things that we have to consider. Number one, engagement in digital community according to the different development authors. It has to be creative because we are using technology as part of the conversations, as part of the engagements. It has to be communicative, meaning there has to be a way wherein one person can relate his or her idea to another person through the use of technology. And third point, it has to be participative, meaning if we are curating a community standards, if we are uh, creating a community rules or online community rules, it has to be participative because all users must be able to contribute in order to protect the digital community that we are building. Hence, the challenge for influencers and of course content creators is how can we jumpstart the discussion on the creation, communication, and participation of our audience as part of the digital landscape. Second point about digital citizenship as a catalyst of engagement, it has to include, as I mentioned before, the discussion on Web 2.0. Web 2.0 na uh, before, as it was defined, though, is the use of social media. It's the activation of the internet, the World Wide Web, as part of the, the landscape. But right now, no, in the quote-unquote we call now this time or this period as post-pandemic era, there is now a new concept. This is what we call Web 3.0. And Web, Web 3.0 is somehow more focused on decentralizing no? uh, open source and, of course, promoting different um, communication tools like, for example, NFTs or uh, cryptocurrencies. But I will not dig deeper on that. But just to share with you, there is no perspective already in so far as the post-pandemic uh, online setup is concerned. And digital citizenship has also must be able no, to champion democracy in so far as protecting citizenship rights. As we all know, in, in the landscape of online discussions, in the landscape of digital engagement, a lot of Filipinos are somewhat, you know, somewhat forgetful that there are laws that actually protect so, um, and differentiates between freedom of speech, libel, and other um, online activities. 
So as influencers and content creators, it is your responsibility to also study those kinds of things. Why? Because it is your responsibility as quote-unquote catalysts of engagement, you have to be the voice. No, You have to be the one that will propel your audience or your fan base if you have. How can they think critically No, insofar as engagement is concerned? Because as part of the discussion on digital citizenship, there has to be a way to make sure that critical attitudes and digital divide no, must be addressed insofar as engagement is concerned. So, mamaya ribigan ko kayo ng mga examples or some tips on how we can actually promote or how can we activate and iterate some ideas and activities such as those kinds of things. And having said that, no, um, another thing that we have to also consider and you have to know as digital influencers or digital content creators, it has to be related your activities must be related to what we call a universal right. The universal right being, and when we talk about digital citizenship, are rights of individuals and necessary condition for social and democratic development in the 21st century society. Why 21st century society? No, uh, Right now, if you are part of the professional field, there's already big talks in so far as hybrid batayo, face to face or whatnot. So those are the kinds of things that we have to consider. And digital citizenship actually redefines public, both the state and the nation perspective and private toward the creation of new scenarios of social interaction and democracy in which all of the citizens must participate. And what do we mean by participation? Citizens facilitating democracy and increasing capacity to exercise power, go open government, fact-checking. Those are the information and things we have to consider as part of the engagement. And digital citizenship has to be an anchor. It has to be a navigation map for all of us. While there's no set in stone standards, because like for example, if you enter in or if you register into a certain social media app, they follow certain community standards. If you register to another application, there's already rules of engagement and something like that. And us being influencers and content creators, we have to be aware of those kinds of things. Because if we violate community standards on certain applications, there's a big possibility that number one, our accounts will be suspended. Or number two, our accounts will be banned or you will be banned from using those applications. So we have to think critically on how we engage or create that environment for our users or even our fan base as part of the discussion. So digital citizenship is the ability to navigate our digital environments in a way that's safe and responsible and to actively and respectfully engage in these spaces. So it has to connect that a better internet starts with you, me, them, him, us, no? We, as digital nat natives, must be able to protect the digital citizenship or community that we want to create. So those are the information and points that I would like to share in this afternoon session. And how can we now check the digital landscape or digital citizenship landscape across ASEAN communities? So just to share with you some ideas, according to the survey provided by Google and Temasek, uh, that ASEAN is the world's fastest growing internet region. Um, for quite some time, Philippines uh, becomes, uh, well, well, Philippines was considered to be social media capital um, in the world. But if I'm not mistaken, in the recent data releases through the data portal, no, there's already a discussion that we are outranked by other countries like India. No, so they are now considered, if I'm not mistaken, if not in the social media capital, but in terms of internet, say, uh, internet discussions or digital landscape, uh, we are outranked already by other countries. Uh, why am I saying this? Because you have to be aware, you have to be informed so that you can curate and you can plan the different ideas and topics that you would like to consider as part of your content creation modules or if not your influencer activities. Ano ano ba yung mga contents that you have to check? Can you can you be the advocate of responsible digital citizenship by providing meaningful content in your respective social media applications? So those are, those are actually the challenges. 
And just to share with you, the 15th Conference of the ASEAN Ministries Responsible for Information, or AMRI, held la, uh, virtual conversations last March 2021. And that they were able to adopt a certain framework, the framework for developing digital readiness among ASEAN citizens. And while it is a broad-based no, and non-binding framework, at least there's already a discussion on how can we promote digital citizenship as part of the new communities or the innovative or the innovations that we are doing right now as part of the digital landscape. So the AMRI provides digital literacy access to information and digital communication within a broader context of developing digital readiness among ASEAN citizens. And how can we how can we promote no how can we make sure that these things will be able to capture our opportunity and so far as the engagement was concerned so having said that allow me to to share with you the framework for developing digital readiness among asean citizens no number one it has to be there has to be digital access Number two, digital literacy as part of the ASEAN engagement must be promoted. And you guys, being content creators and influencers, you have to be adept in digital literacy activities because it is your responsibility to promote no, uh, information sharing. And the last point is about digital participation. Digital participation because you have the expectation of the bigger community that when you have already a strong fan base, or strong uh, strong following no you are responsible in making your fan base informed on the different things happening all around and it has to be truthful as part of the engagement so what are the benefits of the asean member states on digital readiness if a certain country in the asean community must be able to champion digital readiness there is a a bigger opportunity no to enable citizens to access and navigate the digital world. Meaning, this can be like open source information or free access to different innovations or studies, something to that effect. No, Another benefit is that it also allows ASEAN member states to respond to new digital challenges. For example, how can we combat fake news? How, how can we address identity theft? How can we address phishing and something like that? And the third point is more on supporting businesses to make full use of digital technology to innovate new products and services. If later on you as content creators would want to monetize what you are doing, then it will be able to, or the ASEAN itself will be able to provide you platforms that can generate, no, um, of course, uh, generate income or if not, propel the landscape of a responsible digital community. So those are the information that you have to consider. And as pillars of digital citizenship, there has to be two important things that you have to consider. Number one, it has to be related to respect. No? All of the applications, all of the digital citizenship initiatives follow the three things. Accept acceptable user policy for services or applications. As mentioned, uh, the community standards, the terms and conditions when you enter or subscribe to certain applications. No? If you violate it, either you will be suspended or removed or banned. No? Something like that. And the value of respect is also highlighted as part of the pillars of digital citizenship because we have to build safer internet use. No? Um, do, we, do we respond to phishing? Do we respond to to scam texts or scam messages? Do we update our bank accounts without verifying whether or not the email that we receive is actually a legitimate email? No? So something that we have to consider as part of our respect. Why respect? Because there has to be a certain perspective wherein you as influencers, as, as content creators, you must be the catalyst of promoting safer internet use. And last point is about empathy building. Empathy building meaning you understand uh, the different perspectives of different audience. You must be able to iterate and address certain concerns that will also engage them, no? that will empower them. And so far as promoting digital citizenship is concerned. And 
Second pillar of the digital citizenship is about protection. Protection in identity. No? You have to be adept in the information about dark web. Meaning, can I, can I just um, enter my personal information in a certain website that is not secure? So those are the questions that you have to consider. Uh, you have to be aware of catfishing, spamming, scamming, and even online predators. Lately, there's a lot of schemes happening either through text, either through social media, that somehow we are deluded to follow. And as content creators and influencers, you have to be aware of that so that you can protect yourselves on entering that kind of quote-unquote no, scenario. And lastly, of course, protection in the rights and activities of different individuals. In your case, your followers. So just to share with you, when we talk about digital citizenship, you have to be aware of digital footprint. No, a digital footprint, sometimes in other sources, they define it as the digital shadow. Others are seeing it as electronic footprint. And it actually refers to trail of data you leave when using the internet. So it includes the websites you visit, the emails you send, and the information you submit online. So those are the information that you have to be aware of. Everything that you do online, like share, comment, um, post, is actually or forms part of your digital footprint. So where do we see or what are the different sources of digital footprint? So we have public images, social media activities, school records and accounts. Job-related activities, like for example, if you subscribe to a certain professional application wherein you look for opportunity or employment, no? online gigs like kayo, bilang content creators, you must be aware that the contents that you provide online forms part of your digital footprint. And of course, news and events and community group or activities. And case study, just to share with you, and you have to be aware no, that the company of creative group provides a certain insight that today, the employment and even hiring of new employees for their company, part of the HR process is to perform online searches. So you as influencers, as content creators, sometimes you have to be aware. If you type your name in the web browser, you have to double check what are related posts or contents that is associated with your name. So you have to be aware of those kinds of things. Now, the question is, can you erase your digital footprint? In some other cases, yes, you can, but somehow it will entail a lot of activities. It will entail a lot of different legalities. You know what I mean? I mean, you have to, to, to coordinate, to double check, submit petition that you have to remove or you are requesting for the removal of your digital footprint. But in the regular course of things, somehow for regular Filipinos, it's too difficult to do. No? So you have to be aware of those kinds of information and text. And your digital footprint is the record of all your interactions online. So once something is posted or shared, it can be there forever. Sometimes the right? yung, yung, yung posts or content that you, you shared, let's say, five or ten years ago, somehow it's being reactivated by some of your friends or even family members. I mean, you have to take note of those kinds of information and activities. And understanding your digital footprint help you choose and control what you leave online for others to find. Always remember that influ as influencers and content creators, you have the sole control of the contents that you will post. Kaya nga sabi ko sa inyo, it's a digital citizenship plus because you have a higher responsibility, you have a higher stake in promoting your digital citizenship, and digital footprint. Now, for the live quiz, um, just join again through Stylo.com and enter our code, hashtag Digizen Plus, just to have validation in so far as digital footprint and understanding digital citizenship is concerned. So you can join now. You can also scan our QR code in your screen. So we have Kent, Andy, one pa lang, one pa lang yung nag, ano, participate. Pero pa bang hahabol? It's a quick, quick piece lang. So we'll try our best to, to check your understanding in so far as digital community or digital citizenship is concerned. So we have six, seven, 
Meron pa ba? Sige, bigyan ko kayo ng one minute to join. So, Kemi, Loy, ayan, si Renzel, si Lola, Lola, or Lola, and other, and other um, pronunciation. Ayan. Meron pa ba pumapasok? Okay. So, sa mga hahabol, don't forget to follow us or just double check to study.com and enter the hashtag Digizen Plus as part of the code. Alright. So, 20. Let's start with the quiz. So, the things that you do online forms part of your... You have 10 seconds to answer the question. So, parang kahoot lang to. Okay. So, 93% said that the things that you do online forms part of your digital footprint. So, ulitin natin, ha? Uh, your online presence can be part of digital footprint. But in the greater scheme of things, digital footprint is something or everything that you do online. So, yung 7%, I think baka nalito kayo, but okay lang yan. Okay, now let's proceed to the next question. So, si leaderboard natin, si Kent Andy ang nangunguna. Okay, congratulations, Kent and Andy. Um, and we also have Cheryl, Ron, AK, and CC. Now, let's proceed to the next. What makes your digital footprint? 10 seconds to answer the question. What makes your digital footprint? Or what composes or comprises your digital footprint? All right. So, the correct answer I all of the above. Your social media accounts actually is part of your digital footprint. Your email messages is part of your digital footprint. Likes, comments, shares online is actually part of digital footprint. It's all of the above because it somehow summarizes your engagement under the digital footprint um, concept. So, si Ron, Cyril, Jan, Anonymous, and Kent Andy. Or Kent Andy, number five ka na. Okay, next. Which of the following must be included in your digital footprint? So we have 27 participants in this live quiz. Which of the following must be included in your digital footprint? So tingin nyo, which of the following must be included? All right. So the correct answer is... So natin. 62% said that complete name must be included in your digital footprint. Tama kaya? Bank accounts must be included in your digital footprint. So again, the correct answer is that, uh, is that uh, it has to be hobbies and interests. Those must, must be included in your digital footprint. Why is it not possible that you have to put your complete name out there online? Remember, there are somewhat good people. I mean, hashtag, quote and quote. No? Uh, there might be good people using your name. Who will be using your name, your complete name? Kaya it has to be, there has to be a level of protection for you not to post your complete name unless otherwise uh, it's needed. So for, for me, like for example, I don't post my full name, including my middle name in social media, unless it is actually a post from the government or um, there's always a need for, for, for them to post my credentials, I will allow. But in most cases, I don't want my full name to be out there. Okay. Um, bank accounts, why? Why do you post your QR codes? Why are you going to post your numbers online? So remember, um, in the age and community that we have right now, you have to protect your identity. And in this question, why hobbies and interests are is the best answer in so far as creating your digital footprint? As influencers and content marketers or content uh, creators, your following must be able to, or your followers rather, must be able to understand your hobbies and interests so that they can be inspired, they can be um, aware of the different promotions that they can do, no? Or if not, maybe they can get some ideas about your content creation activities or something to that effect. So those are the, the ideas that you have to consider as part of the discussion. So we have Ron... Kent, Andy, Ben, and Loy, and Sura for the leather, leaderboard, rather. So last question, uh, why is it important to think before you post information online? The information you post can be found and can affect your future college and career goals. People that search for you online create an opinion about who you are based on what you post. The information you post is permanent. What's the best answer? All right. The correct answer is all of the above. You have to, uh, you have to double think. Triple think, quadruple think. You have to double check before posting online. All right. 
So 95% got the uh, correct answer. Congratulations, and uh, Kent Andy, for being the number one for this activity. So for the last question, who is in charge of your digital footprint? Social media giants, your parents and friends, family, or you? Sa tingin niyo, as for your final question for this quiz, who do you think is in charge of your digital footprint? Tingnan natin ang results. Oy, 93% said you have you are actually in charge of digital footprint. Always remember that it is your responsibility okay, to curate or if not control whatever you post online. So just some thoughts no, uh, before we proceed to the next topic. Sabi dito, according kay Malisa, um, as someone who has been impersonated before, I find it useful to put my first name and last name, no middle initial because it's private, on my social media to establish my identity and inform people that these are my only verified accounts. Yes. Medyo mahirap mag-pseudonym sa social media kasi baka ikaw pa yung akalain nilang fake account. Yes, that's right. According to kay, to Amor, hobbies and interests can also be a source uh, to access your accounts. Well, partly yes, but somehow as content creators and influencers, you also have to share something to, to your following. But you have to create your certain security um, questions or if not, um, security safeguards so that your accounts will not be used for other things. Okay, so thank you very much for those who participated and congratulations, um, Kent Andy. So hardest question based on the discussion, which of the following must be included in your digital footprint? So thank you very much for joining our quiz. Now, proceeding to the concepts, now we will proceed with module two. So what are the domains of digital citizenship? So digital citizenship aims to lead and assist others to create positive online experience. Second is recognize our actions online will always have an impact for ourselves and others. And third is promote common good for the benefit of all, meaning digital inclusion. So you have to be aware and you have to champion it as influencers and content creators. So what do we mean by the different domains or what are the different domains of digital citizenship? So this is what I call the TBA framework, the thinking online, being online and acting online. So what do we mean by those kinds of things? Thinking online, the TBA of digital citizenship, our purpose is to respect for self and other people. No, I'll be providing some examples later on based on the concepts provided. Uh, being online, the purpose is that you want yourself to be built or to build yourself and connect with other people. No, And the last one or last point is actually acting online. So protecting self and other people. So yung keywords dito sa thinking must be respect for self and other people. Being online, you build yourself, you connect with other people. And acting online is protecting yourself and other people. So how do we do that? So thinking online, you have to respect for self and other people. You must be aware of digital access. The question must be, can all users participate in the digital society at an acceptable level at any time? So dito nakapasok, if you have strong follower or following base or followers, can they access your, your contents where they can access it? Or can the, can the users of certain application be able to check your content? Another point that I would like to highlight is digital etiquette or the netiquette. Okay? The online behavior standards that digital technology users are expected to apply. Do users think of other people when using digital technologies? And the last point is all about legal rights and restrictions. So there has to be some regulation, some sort of regulation in the use of technology use. So in digital law, the bigger question or the hardest question or the question being answered is based on our users are aware of the laws, rules, policies regulating the use of digital space or technologies. In being online, uh, three points that you must consider. Digital communication. Do users have an understanding of digital communication methods and when they are and of when they are correct? No. Um, remember, not all applications must be used. I mean, you have to double check the security. You have to double check the data privacy policy. Because baka mamaya, kinukuha na yung information yun ng hindi nyo alam. No? Uh, another point is digital literacy. For you to be a responsible digital citizen as, as citizens who somehow use digital applications in the digital community, you have to be adept in different information on engagement online. Do you fact check 
or do you have do you as users take time to learn about digital technologies kailangan ba aware kayo sa mga digital policies something like that and for digital commerce then do users have knowledge and protection to shop in a digital world so for you guys i know millennials are uh, millennials no a, a lot of us are doing um online shoppings recently so you have to be aware ano ba yung mga do's and don'ts in doing those kinds of uh, activities and third point In digital citizenship deep dive, you have to protect yourself and other people. So you must be adept in digital rights and responsibilities, digital security, and the third point, digital health and wellness. Do your content or does your content create mental well uh, well-being or health well-being? No, online. Are you somewhat a curator or a content creator that promotes positive vibes in social media? So you have to answer those kinds of questions. And the challenge is, of course, how can we promote this digital citizenship as part of the discussion? And so far as digital citizenship is concerned, and this is a basic, you know, we have to be an advocate of digital empathy. Digital empathy is somehow understanding what other online person is experiencing. Or you must be able to understand the perspective of the person you are talking to the other side of the digital platform. Our goal as content creators is to generate positive experience and healthy online conversations. Second point is digital safety. When we talk about digital safety, we must be able to protect ourselves, our families, and others as we connect through digital devices. As content creators, you must be the champion of privacy. All right, you must be the champions of uh, user accepted uh, guidelines. Right, like for example, when Uh, when do you use uh, when 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 you follow a certain content or when you adopt a certain content? Ano ba yung mga limited free use lang na pwede? Always remember, may mga copyright laws tayo that you have to be aware of as content creators and influencers. I mean, not all, not everything that can be downloaded can be used, no. And you can adopt it that it is your actual um, output. Always remember, um, you have to be aware of those kinds of things and. We have to stop also predators uh, from existing in the digital community. Predators are individuals, groups, or entities that you know um, take advantage of your weaknesses in social media or even in the internet as uh, a whole. And third point that I would like to highlight, as influencers and content creators, you must be the champion of digital truth seeking. So you must be the champions of fact checking initiatives. You must be, no? You must be the voice of individuals and groups, no? That is active in fact checking things. Sabi nga nila, not everything that you can see online is actually the truth. So as content creators and influencers, you must be able to shed light on those kinds of things. Um, just to share with you, I I saw a lot of contents um being posted online, like for example, doing different activities that will address health issues and concerns. Again, if you're not a professional, don't do it. If you don't have any license um in promoting that activity, no, just to ha- just to be trending, quote unquote, please stop. I mean. As influencers and content creators, it is your responsibility that you will be the advocates of um, truthfulness. All right, and which is why you must be able to be informed uh, about three important things: misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. So you can take a screenshot of that so that you have a reference. Kailan ba nang yari si misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation? All right. So how can we reinforce digital citizenship? As part of the discussion this afternoon, our goal can be summarized into three things: um, safety, savvy, and social. Okay. Uh, ang goal natin is to protect the digital citizens, the the people that we are coordinating and conversing with, being protected from or unlikely to cause danger, risk, or injury to yourself or others. Savvy because you wanted you have to be creators of ed, um, digital contents no and practical knowledge and understanding to make good judgments and respecting yourself as a digital citizen meaning in so far as social landscape is concerned you must be cooperative and interdependent no uh, relationships and understandings of others 
And the last point, which will be, of course, um, iterating ideas for for all of you. As citizen, no, as digital citizens, you must consider digital citizenship as a revolution. Revolution because we have to build a culture of responsible digital community. As content creators, you must be responsible in taking topics or creating topics no, that is actually based on facts. Dapat merong safeguards na ito ay na peer review ba to tama ito dapat you will not you are not content creators na nagpo-propel ng false information okay next point amplifying active participation in the digital community if you have strong follower base you must be no um you must be advocates of expanding e-democracy and the third point is of course upscaling for 21st century and paying it forward you have to be clear that you're doing contents because you want to pay it forward to the next generation. You want to build a knowledgeable community. You want to build a strong follower base that is really, you know, social savvy. And of course, uh, protecting the rights of every digital citizen. And just to summarize all those things, you know, how can we catalyze digital citizenship? We have to promote, propose, and protect. As content creators, your role is to promote factual contents, you must propose safeguards or policies that will protect your followers and your fan base. So the question now is, can we do it? And the question is, are you ready to start? So as influencers, the hardest question that you must answer this afternoon is, are you ready to start the revolution? Are you ready to be a content creator that is championing digital citizenship? And with that, maraming maraming salamat. And um, of course, if you want to know more about um, me, you can email me and, of course, message me in social media. So thank you very much. So I'm giving it back to you, Gab. Thank you, Chard. And uh, thank you, Chard, for that very insightful discussion. Though. Um, before you leave, actually, we're, we would like to accommodate three questions uh, for this, just to follow up on that very good and insightful discussion about influencers' role, especially their bigger role in shaping a positive online community. So I want to start the question, um, Chard, no, because the reason why we have this kind of conversation was there were a lot of influencers, um, at the very least, you know, they, they became a major force in influencing the media landscape this past few years, especially leading to the elections, right? And obviously, some influencers are not really using their influence positively, um, in a in in a way that we can call them responsible digital citizens. So, do you think it should be a requirement for influencers to at least become, you know, like be embedded in the responsible digital citizenship discussion before they can use or leverage their influence? So, what's your take on that one? For me, it's a, I'm a strong advocate of creating a responsible digital community. So, all influencers must follow that perspective. You have to be informed because sometimes uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that if you have a content that's trending that's actually the truth i mean you know what i mean uh, as content creators and influencers it is your responsibility to to create that landscape to create that policy that safeguards so for me yung mga participants natin around 69 na dito na content creators you must be the advocate stronger i uh, mean uh, the the vocal advocate that you must create we must create no uh, rules of engagement as influencers and content creators and to answer the question gab yes uh, content creators and influencers must understand basic landscape and information about digital citizenship and other information about content creation and influencer activities. thank you chart i think somebody wants to ask a question uh, and jamie you can unmute yourself and raise the question directly um, just a point of clarification. Um, I've learned a lot from your slides. Siguro because I'm a first time who attended this kind of uh, I have this perspective that as content creators or as um influencers, we are in the middle ground of communicate communicating effectively those facts and ideas that came from a source. Yun yung perspective ko. But now listening to digital citizenship, there is somewhat a uh, burden ba daw? <laughs> There's something like a parang nakita ko sir, parang na-change na. Parang kami na mismo yung nagiging source and somehow would greatly affect 
the ano the people who are listening to what we're saying um siguro yung point of question um as communicators and as ano influencers is there an overarching um above us or parang foundational na mga or people below us that would help us make that ano yung to make sure to protect yung mga information na binibigay namin of course ano yun eh parang parang dapat alam natin yung katotohanan pero ano yung way for us to be to help us na yung pinibigay namin na katotohanan hindi naman kami babalikan na ay mali yan ay parang nandoon siguro ako sa point sir na as ano as um tawag ito as somebody who is carrying this ano this fact or this information meron po bang nagpo-protect sa atin aside from the community that we're we're in po na right now. Parang yun po yung ano, hindi ko kasi alam. Ito po yung mga hindi po alam. Lalo na kung ano, nandito ako sa point na I'm just sharing what I learned and sharing to the point of may source pa rin ako. It's not me who is the source of what I'm I'm sharing but meron book, may person, experts. Yun po sir. Thank you po. Uh, to answer, Ann, sink na lang yung bagay no. Um, three things. Number one, As to the, meron bang organization or group that will fact-check you or will say now what you're saying is wrong, there are a lot of fact-checkers. But for me, I think uh, the best way is to build uh, the fact-checking team through this program. Because as influencers and content creators, you must be able to, um, hindi naman mag-police, but rather you have to establish that there has to be some certain standards that you follow. Um, second point, um, It's actually still a challenge. Meron mag-protecta sa mga influencers or content creators. Uh, as of now, there's still some discussions. And I guess, uh, based on your experience, based on your activities, uh, I hope that you will share your lessons uh, based on the different iterations that you're doing and share it to policy makers. Share it to um, decision makers so that they can advocate for it. Yun yung, yung, yung question. And third point lang siguro, to also um check is you have to be empowered empowered in such a way that through like for example uh, this media civics lab you have to embrace this lab as your home because if there will be some confusions on the contents that you will be releasing later on there is uh because of this program there is already a certain community that will double check and can chime in na hey mali ata to o kaya hey dapat dagdagan mo nito So that's the goal of uh, the community. And building a responsible digital community must not be difficult because ang dami yun eh. Ang dami ng influencers. You have to be truthful lang. And you have to embrace the responsibility of being truth seekers and truth advocates. So yun. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will accommodate questions from other people. So tama yung sinabi ni Chard, no? Um, we have to embrace this community. That's actually the starting point. So even if like we can explore a lot of solutions legally or let's say for example mentoring support at the very least the foundation is this fact checking community or those empowered communities that to, that you are participating and signing up right now. So we have one more question we have two more questions left so let's entertain this question chart The question is um, coming from Robert Dizon. He's asking that when can you consider that you are also a journalist after you got trained in a media literacy training? Can you call yourself a journalist? Um, I'm not a journalist, so I have no authority to say it. But in um, in so far as legality is concerned, it doesn't necessarily follow. Follow na kapag nag-attend ka lang ng seminar or training, automatic yun ka na. I mean. Journalists are out there because they master the concepts. They they follow rules of engagement. They advocate for the truth itself. So for you uh, to be considered journalists, you have to to be um, an advocate or to be a person that will follow the guidelines on journalism. May mga certain level of rules of engagement din dun. So I think the better answer for that question, Robert, is that It doesn't necessarily follow that you just attended a certain master class. You will be that kind of person already. Um, it takes time and it takes effort and of course passion, no? you know, to be considered as journalists. Kailangan mo talaga dapat para kang kabayo. I mean, you have to double check uh, different sources, verify it before releasing it to the media because it may affect the reputation of the person, entities, or 
individuals you are referring to. Today. But that's a good question, Jared. I think because we need to clearly delineate journalists from self-publishing individuals. You know, what's very unique in journalism is you can always have these peer reviews. So um, there's a different set of journalism standards that they need to abide to to be accredited in the media. So it's a different set of standards and that's not what we're doing here in the lab. We're pri uh, the primary purpose of the lab is for civic engagement and making sure that we reach as many people as possible, at least for this one, for this batch, are the content creators and influencers. Let's accommodate one more question before we proceed to the next part of our program. The question came from Renzel Dyson. How can student journalists like me source and use content for multimedia projects safely and ethically? Um, Ransel, you have to make sure that number one, the source of the, your content is uh, open source, meaning pwede siyang gamitin kapag gagamit ka ng mga uh, digital contents. Second point, if there's already an owner, let's say kunwari, digital artwork that you would want to use that artwork as part of your multimedia project, you have to secure permission or Kung hindi ka kayanin because of time constraints, you have to make sure that you acknowledge the source of your contents. Uh, kasi kailangan uh, clear tayo doon. Hindi tayo pwedeng nangunguha lang ng mga content online tapos wala lang sources. I mean, you have to put in your references. Kung hindi kaya makapagpaalam with the, the, the source or the owner, make sure that we acknowledge them. That this is their output, not yours. Ayun, thank you. Chart, before you before we let you go, actually, I don't want to leave this question hanging. There was a follow-up comment that came from Anne. Um, I just want to entertain this because I think this is going to be a recurring question. What if public officials, the very influencers themselves in their communities, are the ones purveying or propagating fake news or disinformation? For me, we are we're still in a democracy, and the power of democracy relies to people resides to us as citizens. So when we have officials or leaders who are propagating false information, we have to call them out. I mean, strong for me. Sa akin, you have to be, um, you have to be that advocate wherein, hey sir, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Governor, kunwari, mali po ito. And you have to support, bakit mo sinasabing mali yun? Um, kailangan din tayo yung mag-build ng community at we have to be active. Hindi tayo dapat sumasakay lang sa isang issue. Dapat if we want to be fact checkers, if we want to promote um, fact checking as part of our civic responsibility, kailangan meron tayong pinanggagaling ang tamang source. Okay? Before before we call them out, we have to put in a lot of pieces of evidence uh, that will support your claim. Or else magmumukha lang siyang parang libel, you know, banter from one point to the other. But to answer quickly yung, yung question, we have to make our leaders accountable. That's how we can do and how we can practice uh, digital citizenship. Yes, and we advocate for collaboration, for even support from the local community, right? So there's always the wisdom of the crowd. You can always call out in a civil manner and then use or leverage the community that you have to even prop up that particular grievance of yours to the proper channels. So thank you so much, Chard. Now, before you leave, we would like to give you a certificate. Let's wait for the tech team to flash our e-certificate here. And let me read a citation. The Certificate of Appreciation is proudly presented to Chard Amazona for sharing his invaluable knowledge and expertise on introduction to digital citizenship during the Media Civics Lab Live Masterclass given this day of December 3, 20, uh, 2022 in Manila, Philippines, signed by yours truly, the founder and president of Break the Fake Movement. Thank you so much, Chard. We're very happy and grateful for all the insights that you shared to us during this first live masterclass. See you around. Now, I know that you guys are really itching to learn to the second, uh, to learn from our second speaker. So without further ado, we are going to talk about the influencer landscape of the Philippines. So we will try to actually relate the previous topic on responsible digital citizenship to now even taking a deep dive on the role of influencers in the Philippines and the dynamic case studies on how we could actually create a community where everybody is responsible in terms of their positioning as digital citizens. But at the same time, most importantly, for those influencers and content creators like you, 
who hold a certain influence in your respective communities, how do you make yourself more accountable in your positions online? And to talk about that is no other than one of my mentors, Janet Terrell. Now, let me introduce herself, her first. Janet Terrell is a multi-awarded e-commerce advocate, digital influencer, and leadership coach. At her highest value, she provides independent insights. She is an independent executive director, certified coach, speaker, behavioral analysis consultant, and of course, many other achievements in here, including being a certified executive coach and certified team coach with Marshall Goldsmith Stakeholder Centered Coaching. She helped the Department of Trade Industry and Industry in developing and facilitating the Philippines e-commerce roadmap from 2016 to 2020. As founding president of the Philippine Internet Commerce Society, she worked on a passage of Y2K law and e-commerce law, retired in 2002, and one of my mentors in the digital marketing space. Let's all welcome the founder of digitalfilipino.com, Nam Janet Doral. Thank you, God. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to be with you um, this afternoon and the rest of the... Um, media team no for this uh for this workshop for with the media civic labs and hello participants i hope you are all doing well uh maybe i can have a feel kung kamusta na mga participants natin how are you doing today can you rate yourself from 1 to 10 giving us an idea on how you're doing from 1 to 10 and 10 if you're doing great and uh maybe a little bit sleepy medyo mga 5 siguro pa medyo sleepy na no um siguro um, I'll be curious, Gab, kung ano rin yung mga expectations ng participants natin. No? Kasi nakita ko, di ba, this is a mid, parang fact-checking yung training natin for digital educators, for influencers, and then for media personalities, no, among others. Hi, Max! Wow! Nandito si Max. Si Max Limpag. Kaway-kaway kay Max. Si Max ang uh, nagsasamit ako dyan ng column ko dati nung nagsusulat pa ako sa sa Sunstar sa Cebu no na mimis ko na nga yung pagsusulat dahil medyo medyo matagal-tagal na ako na pahinga nagparinig kay Max eh no pero anyway sige sige so tuloy na tayo sa ating topic um for for this afternoon actually when Gab gave gave me the topic last last week no to talk about um, the influencer phenomenon in the Philippines uh, there were a lot of uh, considerations that i have to give no knowing also the participants of this session which can be wide and varied and how can you best uh, benefit uh, from this discussion uh, siguro ang Ang gusto kong gawin, I'm gonna touch on the basics for the ba for the sake of our newbies. But at the same time, I'm going to share also some of my experiences in this area, and then uh, some of the issues that I've encountered, no, uh, as an as an early influencer and when working with influencers. So, siguro yun ang pwede kong maad na value sa conversation today, no, yung uh, yung transition no, na from a writer in a publication na naging nagkaroon ng sariling platform uh, to to being an influencer and to working with influencers. And I guess, uh, admittedly, for someone who has crossed the line, no, yung parang um, for for various reasons. No? And, I, and siguro mag-share din ako on that para kahit pa paano, mas may ano rin tayo, mas, mar mas maraming dynamism din yung discussion natin. Alright? And of course, uh, uh, feel free to share your questions and your insights uh, later on no? as we proceed with the discussion. So for the benefit of our newbies, normally, uh, why do brands thought of the idea that they want to work with influencers because usually when companies wants to promote their presence and wants to be known um, the usual recourse is for you to promote your products through portals or uh, join um, join communities where various companies are featured you can also advertise to promote yourself and you can also uh, put up your own online presence no and each one of them has its pros and cons. And then uh, later on, pumasok yung concept ng search visibility or search engine visibility. Uh, siguro just to have an interaction with our participants. Ano sa tingin nyo ang ibig sabihin ng search visibility? Pag sinabi sa company na dapat 
you you need to have good search visibility online. What does that mean? Uh, would you like to type in the chat box when someone tells you that you need to have good search visibility online? Uh, what does that mean? No? Yeah, no? Kung company nyo yung unang lalabas, pag may tinatype na keyword, digital presence, come up first sa Google search. So, um, yung early forms ng digital marketing at uh, influencer marketing in the Philippines, at least in my observation, nagsimula dyan sa need ng company na lumabas sa search results, yung SEO or SEO ranking. No? Doon siya dun siya nagsimula no and kasi para mag-rank ka sa search results kailangan maraming naka-link sa iyo para mag-rank ka kapos hindi lang basta mag-rank ka kailangan maraming articles about you no and articles can come from traditional publications and then later on articles can come from um mga ano na uh, mga blogger write up articles na nakaka-influence din siya ng search results. So the more links you have, especially if the links are credible, if the sources of the links are credible and especially if these sources of pages are also active and deemed credible by the search engine, tumataas yung ranking. And uh, malaki ang impact ng ranking sa search results. And in fact, uh, halimbawa, before, I have a client before na gustong malista sa isang deal platform. Eh, yung deal platform can only feature two or three companies for that category. Eh, bago pa lang yung business niya. Napili siya as one of the three kahit na bago pa lang yung business niya kasi nung tinipe yung brand niya, ang dami-dami articles na sulat ng mga influencers na nakapag-try nung service niya. No? So lahat yon malaki ang impact. No? So, so as a result, um, if you have a website, whether you, you have a personal website or you are a company who wants to be seen online, you normally want to work you want you normally wanted to have a lot of articles linking to you at doon nagsimula yung influencer marketing the early forms of influencer marketing in the in the early days nasa blogging community siya kasi ang hinahabol natin dito ay yung visibility sa search results para bang at the end of the day whatever people find online what is important is when they start googling about it or using Bing or whatever is the search engine option of their choice. Kailangan lumabas yung, lumabas yung entity sa search results and all other related articles that will contribute or lend to the credibility of the entity. However, of course, when social media um, became popular uh, with the rise of Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and now uh, TikTok, no, among others. Nagkaroon tayo ngayon ng mga, nag, nagbago yung definition ng influencer. Parang dati, pag sinabi mong influencer, lalo na yung mga early days ng mga mga influencer marketing like Nufnang uh, and, and the other early players at that time, talagang nakafocus siya sa blogosphere. Kaya nung unang ano, gustong, gustong ng tao na maging blogger. In fact, uh, I used to organize a blogging summit before, no? yung Philippine Blogging Summit. I blog sa UP Diliman uh, under, the, under the program of uh, attorney JJ Dicini. And we were doing that for, if I'm not mistaken, umabot yata kami ng 13 years of doing the Philippine Blogging Summit. And we've seen how it has evolved no? from blog bloggers doing it out of passion to bloggers monetizing their presence uh, to bloggers uh, endorsing brands uh, to bloggers tackling issues to bloggers uh, influencing search engine results. And then, uh, ayun na, pumasok na yung social media. And then when social media uh, became popular at, at nauso pa yung mga pages, no? I think ang pinaka game changer dyan yung mga pages. Eh. Nung nagkaroon na ng Facebook page, no? and of course yung pagkakaroon din natin ng mga YouTube accounts, tapos mas bumilis pa yung internet. Uh, that paved the way for uh, para mang YouTube influencers talaga magkapag-gain and traction. Kasi before, even though YouTube started early, even though you want to watch it, maybe your internet speed might be the one uh, hampering 
your ability to watch and even create YouTube videos for upload, no? Kasi you're dealing with all of these connectivity issues. However, has as connectivity has improved, tapos na uso pa yung mga uh, podcasting, na uso pa yung um, yung affordable na digital cameras, uh, na uso din yung uh, mga free editors among others. Uh, all of a sudden na democratize yung production ng digital mas democratize na siya uh, i used to have a podcast no i produced mga i think naka more than 20 episodes din ako sa podcast ko at digitalfilipino.podomatic.com and i remember um we i think i'm one of the first na nagkaroon ng advertiser sa podcast i was charging 5000 pesos for sponsorship in my podcast and i was able to hustle that because ang dami nag invite sa akin noon na mag-talk ng pro bono. So ang ginagawa ko no, pa may nag invite sa akin ng talk, pro bono yung talk, uh, lalo na kung company siya, o kaya tatanungin nila ako kung magkano PF ko. Ang sasabihin ko lang no, ah, don't worry about it. Ang favor ko na lang sa iyo, mag-sponsor na lang kayo sa podcast ko. Yun ang sinasabi ko. And because of that, siguro naka, ano rin ako, nakalimang sponsors din ako sa podcast ko. And at that time, I was collaborating with uh, an entity uh, with, uh, de, uh, with a podcast uh, expert, si Pocholo Gonzalez. Para siya yung nag edit So kahit paano nag-revenue sharing kami dun, doon. No? Pero after a while, um, parang, parang I was thinking kung where, where will this lead? No? Or was I too early in the podcasting days back in 2005, 2006? So nag-switch ako to video and uh, merong, merong player noon na parang panlaban kay YouTube, si Vimeo. And Vimeo has privacy features, um, parang unique player features, among others. So nag-take nag ako ng Vimeo Premium. Kasi ang problem kay YouTube at that time, parang ang daming nag -re -re upload ng videos mo. So medyo rampant yung copyright violation no early days ng YouTube. Kaya mas naging preferred ko noon to use uh, Vimeo. And for Vimeo or Vimeo, but pasensya na kayo, minsan nasanay lang akong tawagin siyang Vimeo, pero Vimeo. Pero for Vimeo, um, meron siyang mga privacy that you can only enable a few people, you can password enable it, among others. So I develop a lot of training programs for my community that they can access my videos if they know the password or it can only be embedded on my website. So a lot of my tutorials Kaya wala akong tutorials gano sa YouTube because most of my tutorials, almost a thousand videos yata yun, nandun sa Vimeo. No? So we did a, a video blog and published for, siguro we did 40 plus episodes and um, and talking about featuring uh, different uh, personalities. no Parang, parang it's, a, it's an infotech uh, type of blog. And I, I think after 40 episodes, parang I started questioning myself tutuli ko pa ba siya o hindi na so eventually i took a pause and maybe decided to focus more into online uh, education pero all this time kaya ka nagki-create ng content kaya ka required na mag-create ng content is that is a primary criteria for influencer marketing if people would want most people people who would like to work with an influencer must have a niche following. And niche following is established when you have niche content. So for bloggers, it can be the articles that they write. For podcasters, it's their episodes, yung mga interviews nila. While for uh, video bloggers, it's their video content, whether it's educational, entertainment, fun, depending on their uh, focus. At, and I think that's what uh, also distinguish uh, celebrity endorsers versus uh, influencers. No? For, for celebrity en endorsers, you're already capitalizing on their existing brand, their following, among others. Na brands would like to connect and take advantage of, of that established following. No? For influencers, if if you're if you're focused on the concept of idea sharing, um, then more of you, you want to connect on popular topics because you want to see people talking about the topic, 
discussing it, you want to share content so that you can be part of a bigger community talking about the topic. So, kaya na uso rin yung paggamit ng hashtag, no? Kaya yung mga early influencers sa Instagram using uh, early, sa Instagram are fund users of hashtag hanggang hashtags gets adopted on LinkedIn and on Facebook and a lot of people are doing it as well. Um, now, people usually want to work with social media influencers uh, because meron silang premise. No? Uh, initial premise is that if, if they have been doing it for a while and if they have been consistent on their topic, then more or less their audience know they know already what their audience wants no and they are also able to connect with their audience um and at the same time uh yung pagko-create din nila ng content talaga nakaka-connect sa kanilang market uh, by the way no the the slides that you're looking right now this this is one of my parang mga kam, mga collaboration before that I made with Burb when we did a an influencer marketing uh, webinar series, no, like why brands should work with info, with social media influencers and how should social media influencers build their following. So, how effective are influencers in creating awareness? So, medyo iba iba siya, no. So, maybe I'll take a, a step back. Uh, definitely, anything you post online can be used against you, no. Kaya para bang whatever you post, whether you're posting it for fun or you're posting because you have an opinion, pwede kang magkaroon ng backlash, no? positively or negatively. Ako, I had an experience before where I facilitated a meeting through the Internet and Mobile Marketing Association of the Philippines. Nagkaroon kami ng meeting noon on whether influencers or bloggers who work on campaigns need to get a DTI permit. Yung DTI permit number, especially if they're doing influencer campaigns no? or part sila ng isang influencer campaign or bloggers themselves running their own promotion. So I wrote about it and naging, naging issue yon online. No? Uh, siguro that was the first time na nakatanggap yata ako ng mga 600 comments on my blog. And I was using Facebook as a commenting tool at that time. So I had to answer all those comments. And uh, so parang yun, no? I was only trying to educate. Pero kung tutusin, nag-backlash siya sa akin. To the point, nagkaroon pa kami ng DTI hearing just to discuss yung, just to have a... Uh, a clear idea whether it is covered or not kasi yung DTI speaker natin, namin at that time said yes and then during the meeting para nagkaroon ng discussion na maybe pag ganitong amount or below wala na kapos kapag brand initiated dapat brands ang kukuha ng permit and then recently yung Ad Standards Council uh, release advertising guidelines especially when working with uh, key online influencers na, na they can proactively apply a for a permit, whether the product is regulated, even if the product is not regulated, pero kung hindi siya nag-apply ng permit at may nag-call out for violation, they can be penalized. If I'm not mistaken, the penalty can be up to half a million no, for the uh, 200,000 ba? I think 200,000 up to half a million. So that is why whatever we post online can be used against us, whether it is in the form of blogs, it is in the form of your YouTube video, your TikTok post, your Instagram post, or maybe even your Twitter post, no? Depende kung gano siya ka controversial. And then uh, you can also use uh, social media for advocacy. Uh, there was a time that I was uh, trying to raise funds, no? For one of my fellow bloggers in the community, na nagkaroon siya ng tuberculosis sa spine, and we were really looking for help, no? Para makapag-raise ng money. And through the post and through appealing on social media. Uh, nakaraise naman kami ng kulang-kulang na 120 if I'm not mistaken. And that was used to spend for six months on hospitalization until nakarecover na si Randolph. Randolph was actually a popular uh, YouTube uh, persona. No? Uh, nag, sa mga tech gadgets siya. siya si, ang original screen handle niya ay Pinoy Screencast. I'm not so sure kung Pinoy Screencast pa rin yung handle na ginagamit niya. Um, in this another example, although I think hindi wala na yata tong site na to, yung si skinphilosophy.com. When skinphilosophy first came out, parang ang challenge niya 
wala siyang I mean, matagal magparanking. And then of course, even if you are in a prominent area like BGC, hindi ka naman di basta-basta makapansin ng tao. no? Especially kung katapat malapit ka sa mga shops ng mga popular sa skincare category. At hindi pa lumalabas kagad sa search results. So, so normally, if you have a new website, yan, gagamit, gagamit ka ng mga iba't ibang ways para organically mag mag ka sa search results. Yes, you can do YouTube, uh, you can do Facebook ads to promote your services, pero usually you will also use um, uh, Facebook Facebook advertising, blog blog marketing, among others, hanggang sa eventually mag ka sa search results. Pag nag ka na sa search results, it is easier to approach popu- mas popular na influencers. Kasi minsan sa una, Even if you want to approach popular influencers, pag hindi ka kilala, it's hard to negotiate, no? Um, parang mapepresyohan ka kagad. So, pero kung kahit paano nakapag-establish ka na ng identity mo, then it will be easier to approach kasi kahit paano, yung influencer, pa nag-research din siya, ah, marami na pala nagsulat sa kanya, marami na pala nag-feature sa kanya, marami na palang ganito, marami na palang ganyan. So, their thinking might be a little different na, no? Uh, moving forward. So, your content, usually when people want to work with uh, influencers, palagi natin maririnig na aspiration ng clients. Magba-viral ba yan? <laughs> Sometimes, alam nyo, yung content na sobra-sobra ang pagnanasa mo na mag-viral, hindi yun na nagba-viral. Kapos kung ano yung hindi mo inaasahan mag-viral, yun na nagba-viral. No? So, it can, sabi nga, East or West misan ang ang nangyayari sa kanya. So, why so for brands, why do they work with social media influencers? So usually the pitch to brands is yan, they can help grow the presence, pwedeng manotis yung content, no? Uh, pwede kang makapag-start ng conversation dun sa following ng brand and also engage their followers kasi may mga influencers na kahit na konti lang ang following nila pero pwedeng mataas ang kanilang engagement. Uh, yung kasi ang challenge ngayon eh. Customer engagement is the is is the new customer service and customer engagement is uh, um, parang ano rin siya no, mas critical ang importance niya sa content management. Of course that is debatable no for a lot of people pero kung tutusin malaking ano siya no malaking aspect siya uh, yung nga lang yung number ng influencers sa Philippines iba-iba no pwedeng at one point ganito karami pero pag may napahinga pwedeng babaksak kagad ang numbers kaya usually may mga definition tayo what who is a social media influencers nung active pa ako in working with bloggers Ang criteria ko noon, dapat yung blog was active for the past three months and was publishing articles at least once a week. Yun ang definition ko ng active na blogger. Uh, pero for others, their definition of an active blogger might be someone who is posting every day. Uh, for others, pwedeng sabihin nila, social media influencer siya kapag uh, yung videos niya or yung TikTok post niya nag, o Instagram post niya nagkakaroon ng ganitong likes. So, yung definition is very, I, I have to admit, it's very subjective. no? Wala talagang yung yung masasabi mong standard. Pero sa akin, ganun. Now, kung yung blogger So yung sinasabi ko na nagpo-post once a week, no? Tapos uh, for the past three months, yun ang definition ko. That is across uh, various social media platforms. Yun ang definition ko sa kanya now. Ngayon, kung hindi maiiwasan na dahil ito na yung kabuhayan niya, so most likely they also work with brands, no? Tapos sabi ang magiging definition ko na niya, dapat at least 50% ng content niya ay non non sponsored not not sponsored kasi kung lahat na lang ng post niya sponsored eh parang i don't think any fan will be happy na yung content creator na fina-follow niya puro sponsored na lang ang laman parang wala nawawala na yung yung original connection sa brand may mga SEO bloggers talaga na walang ginawa kundi umaten ng event left and right at uh, mag-publish ng mga press releases kasi talaga ang purpose nila is for SEO pero kapag ang pag pag ang hinahanap mo talaga yung may engagement talagang yung pang influencer level uh, then 
yung hinahanap mo mas have a balance of original content versus uh, promotional content that for the work that they have done for brands no so siguro bago natin puntahan tong how to look for social media influencers ano ang first step siguro mag-review tayo ng mga ng mga articles na publish that that further talks about the issues that we have today but before i move on meron ba kayong ideas or insights that uh, you would like to share uh, based dun sa mga based dun sa mga na share ko so far meron ba kayong gusto sabihin and uh, gab i will appreciate if you can uh, pm me uh, parang time check lang how much time do i still have kasi baka mamaya makerid makerid away ako sa oras no i just want to make sure na na i have ample time for my discussion sige sige so tuloy na natin yung discussion natin. So okay pa ba naman tayo so far? If, we're, if we are good so far, can you type 2 in the chat box just to let me know that you are good so far? So what I would like to do at this point is I would like to share some of the para mga challenges natin na nakikita. Of course, palaging bukang bibig ngayon yung how influencers are affecting how you know, the, the amount of influence that they have in so far as influencing opinions on elections actually that's not uh, medyo matagal-tagal na siyang nangyayari mula nung magsimula na yung social media palaging tinatanong will we be able to will social media be able to elect a president no in the future may mga ganung discussion pero Pero misa may, may difference sa nangyayari sa Philippines and in other countries. I recall uh, a few years back nung nagkaroon ng election sa Singapore, parang supposedly para may party na parang yun ang popular sa social media na parang yun ang ini-expect ng tao na mananalo. And yet when election results came out, hindi yun ang nanalo. No? So, and I think in the early years of social media, napansin din natin yun sa Philippines. Um, I recall nagkaroon ako ng campaign sa social media for a, for an election campaign. Kaso in-engage na yata ako one month before. At alam nyo kung ano yung pinapamanage at that time. It was search results. Kasi yung parang sa search results noon, kapag hinahanap mo yung information about the candidate, when you type the candidate's name, yung page one ng search results niya, yung mga negative articles ang dumalabas. So the mission then was to bury the negative articles and let the better articles uh, come out on page one of search results. Tapos nandun na yung um, pag, pag halimbawa mag-guest na sa TV, uh, mag, ano, magko-comment-comment on social media, magko ayan na yung pagko-commenting. I think, although hindi naman, di ko naman mahasabing trolling yun, no? pero of course, I'm sure naka-encounter na rin ako ng group na yun naman ang expertise nila. May topic, so para bang they have, they have to come in dun sa discussion and, you know, para bang push a certain perspective. So, so kung tutusi, in the early days, uh, meron ng ganun. Kaya nga, kaya nga marami mga, kaya I don't blame why some news outlets um, and news portals are disabling the comment section of their of their website. Kasi you might have an active uh, site. Siyempre, kung ikaw yung may-ari ng publication, tuwang-tuwa ka na ang dami nagko-comment. I got the chance to work before for a publication na kinonvert yung website nila from a traditional website to WordPress. And, um, and nakikita ko talaga, lalo na yung mga opinion columns ng mga, ng mga uh, columnists, grabe ang mga comments doon. And sabi ko nga eh, ano ba tong publication na napasukan ko? Sabi ko parang lahat yata ng ganitong wing na perspective nandun lahat sa comments area. Na parang, parang bang pag nandun ka, parang feeling mo eh, napaka, napakalakas ng opposition uh, versus the administration. no Pero, uh, pero later on, parang ganun din, no? papasok na yung perspective na are, are these opinions real in the first place? How do you know that they are real? And then, dun din papasok yung sinasabi nating uh, you can also be liable for the comments that get posted sa, sa site mo. Uh, there was a blogger na nag-feature siya ng issue 
about an entity na parang maraming emplo em former employee complaints. So, parang sinulat niya about it. Very objective naman yung pagkakasulat niya. Pero, wow, the comment sections were really heavily, ano, talagang attack, no? Ginamit siya ng mga employees na may angst no sa company to really express their thoughts and started mentioning people's uh, names left and right in the in the comment section and to the point nakipag meeting yung company dun sa blogger and the, the blogger was asked pwede ba niyang i-turn off yung comment section niya kasi names are being mentioned and then ang naging perspective niya um i don't want my my readers to think that I am biased towards the towards you, the entity. What I can do instead, if you want, you can read the issues. Why don't you answer in, re in response to what I have published? And I will gladly publish it for you. I can also give you questions. Yun ang sinabi niya. Para I can work with an article for you para i, i ano siya. So parang nag-end on that note yung kanilang conversation. And then a week later, nagulat na lang siya Uh, nakatanggap na siya ng sapina. I think sapina yata. Yeah, to appear in a hearing kasi para nagiging accessory siya to libel. And to the point na accuse siya ng libel, no? Uh, recently merong I think in the in the in one one PH na news this past week, uh, pinag-usapan yung libel. And as you know, um Libel is a sensitive topic, especially in the media, among the media players and even to social media influencers. No? And for any user in general, when the cybercrime law was first passed uh, back in 2012-2014, during that time, 85% of the case dockets ng Department of Justice were all libel, libel cases. No? And sa libel kasi, Um, although kung ikaw yung third party entity, pwede kang independent of whatever gets published or promoted on your site. Sabihin mo, I'm not responsible for my for the opinions of my viewers. Pero the moment you are notified, yung kinol na yung attention mo, kinol na yung attention mo sa mga comments at in-inform ka na parang libelous na yung mga comments na pumapasok dyan. And you are asked to take responsibility. Tapos nag-decide ka na, I'm not gonna interfere, that's their opinion. You know? So parang in essence, para ka na rin nagiging accessory. Yun yung, yun yung point of view nung nag-file nag ng case. No? E ang challenge noon, the moment na magkaroon ng perception na para may ground siya at talaga nagmatigas ka, Uh, okay lang naman yun kasi you can really stand by your own opinion. Kaya lang tandaan nyo, libel is a, is a criminal case in the Philippines. Pag, pag the moment makatanggap ka ng, the moment there's merit or ground, the moment the fiscal finds merit or ground on on the complaint, that that complaint will proceed in court, uh, mafaf, mabibigyan ka ng warrant of arrest and you have to file a, mag-file ka ng, mag-ano ka, mag, mag-bail ka for for 75 for 75k no para para makalabas ka sa kulungan so while your case is ongoing so it's 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 challenging no so here you are on one end na kaya nga di ba may fina-file na bill si senator um, Montulfo for decriminalizing libel particularly for legitimate journalists hindi necessarily na mag-extend siya to non-journalists. Kapos papasok na naman yung argument. When is a blogger a journalist? And when is a YouTuber a journalist? No? So doon na naman papasok yung um, argument na yan. Um, I think for influencers, the moment you start entering into campaigns, um, you might do it for advocacy. But of course, there are players, lalo na yung mga nasa trolling, yung nag engage in the trolling business. Pwede hindi na sila for, for, the, for the belief in the candidate. No? Pwede for, for monetary purposes na siya. Or pwede nasa writing ka, pwede you're not necessarily supporting the candidate. Pero since it's gonna pay you, it's gonna pay you anyway to write it. Parang may nakita nga ako eh, uh, 
comics creator, parang kinontrata siya ng candidate na gum- mag- gumawa ng comics. Kapos sabi niya, hindi niya in-endorse yung candidate. In fact, hindi niya ro iboboto yung candidate. Pero since babayaran siya to write the comics, natanggapin niya yung project. No? Um, pero what if mas way yung belief niya in the process or parang out of, out of ano, mag, parang i-endorse na niya kasi eto na it, this is the one who's gonna put food this gig is gonna put food on the table no so pwedeng mag mas masway na rin yung parang position niya so para may, may mga misa nagkakaroon din ng ganung issue no kapag yan papasok ka sa point na you start you start participating in activities of this nature of course for bigger play for bigger personalities in the influencer space talagang mas naka-focus yan dun sa kanilang what's close to their heart kaya nila pipiliin yan pero for the lower for for the for the others it might it might be different so depende if um, uh, on which perspective it is coming from kaya very subjective siya uh, kaya nga di ba that's why we're having forums like this no kasi we're reminded that the country has to take influencers role in spreading misinformation more seriously and at the same time Um, I think nagtitik na naman seriously, kaya nga, di ba? Pagpasok na pagpasok ng administration, ang una-una natin narinig sa BIR, eh, yung pagtatak sa mga influencers, di ba? Yun yung una-una natin narinig sa BIR, yung ting- tingnan yung income ng mga, ng mga influencers, how much money are they making. Kasi sa TikTok ngayon, uh, makakakita ka ng mga campaigns, um, how much yung nakita kong campaign sa TikTok, Uh, five TikTok posts for your brand without agency service fee. Ano siya? 30,000 pesos. No? Um, engaging nano-influencers. And if you want to engage higher... Meron ako naging campaign na supposedly CSR activity siya. Uh, parang meron kami ipupush na policy paper na asking people, asking government to adopt to para ba asking society to become aware of the policy paper and to lobby others to support the policy paper. Ako nagulat nga ako, it's a campaign. Tapos alam ko, uh, lima yata kaming pinagpilian for the campaign. Tapos yung tatlo yata mga talagang sikat na sikat na influencers. Ang pricing na pinag-uusapan nila for for the posting of of that uh, advocacy was around uh, 150 to 200,000 ang pinag-uusapan nila. So it's so when they talk to me parang uh, so, so, nagbigay ako ng idea pero I, I'm very sure I can assure you it's a small very small fraction of what what the bigger celebrity what the, what the celebrities were charging. Um para gawin yung campaign tapos sinabi ko pa hindi ako yung star ng campaign what i will do is i will do a, a crowd campaign yung getting people a lot of people sa crowd to become ad- advocacy and supporters of the campaign so rather than me my poster my video asking people to share it i'm gonna create several posters and videos for different people and all of us sharing it yun na si Jesco para mas, mas medyo mas may ground swell yung approach so so kung tutusin um iba-iba iba-iba yung nagiging approach minsan may mga bloggers may mga influencers na na approach sabihin eh oh itong bill na to hinaharang ni ganito so we might let's let's attack this for for making harang. So, may mga ibibigay sa yung mga meme images na parang supposedly ipopost para to depict yung, para i-emulate kung paano hinaharang yung campaign. No? So, so it's a, medyo, medyo weird din siya. No? Pero it happens. No? Um, so, this is a page of uh, Star Engage who offers influencer marketing in the Philippines. Although I cited some, some data already, pero meron silang mga binabanggit dito na na caught my interest na tingin ko um uh, pwede rin pwede rin na pag, pag pagkuhanan ng ideas no so mga common influencer marketing campaigns binanggit dito product launches brand awareness content generation and community building at least for their company this is the kind of engagement that they get In reality, before the pandemic, talagang ito yung norm, no? Para ba bloggers are being invited to product launches. Kaya nga nauso yung 
'di ba? Sa, sa alam mo topic namin yung ngayon eh, yung mga gate crashers, mga na supposed mga gate crashers na supposedly nagpapanggap na vloggers, mga gate crashers na supposedly nagpapanggap na startup entrepreneurs. Na to the point na alagay na sila sa blacklist, no? Yung huwag papasukin pag itong supposedly vlogger na to aaten, no? Ganyan ganyan. Kasi marami nga nag <laughs> marami mga nag-gate gate crash or para ba they said they are this pero they attend they eat they get everything pero they don't publish anything about it talagang ano lang talaga sila ano yun kuha 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 no kaya um mi kaya yun lang no kaya ako tutusin sa industry parang isa we we look out tayo tayo mismo nagaano tayo uy andito ka asan na yung article mo apa publish ko Lumapos na, magpas na yung dalawang buwan, tatlong buwan, wala kang makita ni Anino nung article na yon Pero sa ilang, ilang events na yon napagkakakitaan yun na pinagpuhupuntahan nila. No? So, nangyayari yan, nangyayari yan not only sa, sa iba't ibang sectors. No? Maraming ganyan na nangyayari. Um, so, of course, we, we, they can also be used for brand awareness. Now, brand awareness can be two things. No? There's brand awareness because you're launching a product. and you want people to know the product. So ang nangyayari doon may nang, may nangyayaring product sampling. Uh, products gets uh, delivered to the influencer. Tapos yung influencer gagamitin niya yung product tapos i-share niya yung experience. Kaya nga di ba, marami mga makeup, kumakain at kung ano-ano pa, magsis- magsisipilyo ng charcoal toothpaste, papakita din ng umitim yung ipin nila, no? Pero on the other side of uh, brand awareness, pwedeng ano rin naman siya. Um uh, how do you call that? competition campaign so para sabihin ko uh, organic is better than synthetic organic cough medicine plant based cough medicine is better than synthetic cough medicine okay sa sabihin naman ni synthetic cough medicine uh, when you take synthetic cough medicine you will get faster uh, uh, you will get better in two days while you take Uh, plant-based cough medicine, it's gonna take you two weeks before you heal. So, misa may mga ganong klaseng uh, brand awareness na campaign. Meron din mga brand awareness na campaign na uh, pwedeng may issue, parang ang role mo is to explain the issue better. para ka nagiging explainer ng issue. So, misa may mga ganon din na klase ng campaign. Nako, seven minutes na lang tayo. So, uh, Yung recent na We Are Social Report uh, na lumabas nung early this year, pinakita na although a lot of people read uh, mainstream media, pero a lot of Filipinos are beginning to really consume mga influencer content. Maybe for entertainment value, for education, among others. Pero kung tayo, na-alert tayo do sa fake content na pumapasok sa social media, actually, uh, TikTok is no exemption to that. no Sa TikTok din, maraming mga Uh, challenging na content na lumalabas doon lalo na doon sa mga topics on weight loss uh, yan sa politics no at kung ano-ano pa pwedeng nagkakaroon din yung mga medical advice no marami ring mga misinformation na nangyayari kaya yung fact checking natin Uh, it will be interesting kung paano natin maka-carry out yung fact-checking sa TikTok na platform. Pero kung dutusin, siya yung bagong channel ngayon for fact for for misinformation. Kasi, di ba, the videos are too short. Tapos parang nasa archive na siya. Tapos ginagamit mo lang yung search. So paano mo chachikin isa-isa yon? Tapos paano mo iko-call yung attention na dapat ma-fact-check siya dahil hindi accurate yung information na sinishare sa kanya. So doon na papunta yung... Doon na tayo pupunta, no? Uh, pwedeng in the future, majority of the misinformation gagamitin yung mga platforms that is discarded. No? Um, and nakikita natin yan, no? That's why the platform is now popular for for live stream shopping, di ba? Pag pumunta ka ng TikTok, pwede ka na mag-shopping sa kanya. Sa mga, dis- sa mga talks ko sa DTI, usually ang nagiging concern ng mga... Ng, mga government agencies how non bfad products non bfad registered products are being marketed on social media promoted on platforms promoted by influencers nang wala silang bfad permit number and what if those products may result to harm to the consumer paano na yon ano yung responsibility 
nung mga influencers uh, pag nangyari yon no so nandun yung mga ganong klasing uh, challenge and marami rin namang siguro i i focus ko na lang uh, sa sa <laughs> di ba na, na uso to di ba sa social media of course palagi sinasabi you should share your knowledge, you share your insights, you also add value. Pero ganun pa man, pag ginagawa natin siya, sabi ko nga sa inyo eh, whatever you post can be used against you eh. Pag medyo nagkamali ka na sabi o masyadong mayabang yung pagkakasabi mo up to the point na parang nanlalait ka na sa pagkakasabi mo. Uh, pwedeng, ano rin no, people can get annoyed and and call you out no so kaya meron tayo tinatawag na smart shaming no so it's already happening and it's not only and it's happening in different uh, parts of the world no yung pag masyadong nagmama yan yung parang feeling na parang parang ano nagmamarunong masyado um i think um ang challenge na ganung ang perspective ko ron It's a communication problem. It's a communication problem. Kasi pag pag nagko-communicate ka, kailangan isipin mo talaga sino ba yung sino para sino sino ba talaga yung target audience ng message. So, kung halimbawa ang alam mo na yung target message mo pang masa, then you really have to tone it down para ma-appreciate siya ng masa. Uh, the moment na yung content mo magkaroon ng blame game, and you start hitting on a certain segment, it is possible talaga na magre-react yung segment na yon, and will find false or will find offense um, to whatever you say. no? Kaya as communicators, uh, yan yung challenge natin. Um, kung kung na-shame tayo for what we said, isipin natin, ano bang mali sa sinabi ko? Um, there was a time na siguro naalala ni Max to, nung napasa yung cybercrime law. When the cybercrime law was passed, although hindi naman ako nag-lobby, hindi naman ako na-involved sa lobbying for it, gumawa ako ng article explaining what the cybercrime law was. And because of that article, para siguro in a span of three to four days, I got interviewed in radio, TV, mga around 13 siguro yun kung bibilangin ko. And I realized ko, kaya pala siya ganun karami kasi parang walang nagsasalita pro for the cybercrime law no and and nung nung minonitor ko nga yung pagkaka-feature sa kanya nung na nung na feature yung interview sa ANC may nagko-comment nga doon na uh, para bang I was hammering on the cybercrime para bang I was hammering on my point so bad to the point na in love daw siya sa cybercrime law na para ayon para hindi na siya galit do sa cybercrime law so So, kung tutusin, wala namang umaaway sa akin nung, while I'm making tanggol. No? Kapos nung nagpo-post na ako ng infographic, ayun na, may nag-call na ng attention ko. Sabi nga, I know what you're doing. Parang, parang kino-call out niya ako kasi parang bine-brainwash ko raw yung tao dun sa negative effects ng cybercrime law by, by emphasizing what is good about the cybercrime law. And, uh, pero may mga nag-comment din dun sa iba na magrespetuhan tayo ng opinion. So, ibig sabihin, meron din pro for the cybercrime law. Kaya naalala ko one of the things na one of the one of the provisions sa uh, cybercrime law na tinanggal was uh, unsolicited communication. Uh, ni repeal yun eh kasi unconstitutional daw kasi it will hamper freedom of expression. And then some people were saying uh, and nowadays pag nakakakita ka na ng text cam sa cellphone mo pangalan mo binabanggit ko ano inaalok sa iyo araw-araw daw na araw-araw na lang may notification ka na nanalo ka pag tinitingnan ko siya palagi ko naiisip ito ba yung unsolicited communication na pinoprotektahan ng freedom of expression yung freedom of freedom na spam ako sa aking cellphone at alukan ako ng sandamakmak na scam sa cellphone ko no o spam sabi, kaya to, to, to the point, I, I'm beginning to ask mga lawyer friends, sabi ko, possible ba na mag-file ulit ng appeal sa Supreme Court na i-review ulit yung cybercrime law? Kung yung unsolicited communication sa cybercrime law, talaga bang unconstitutional? <laughs> kasi nga, with everything, kasi sabi ko, baka at that time walang case study eh. Ito na, may case study na. no Dapat ma-real-time tracking na itong mga ng gugulong ito. Na, yun, i-repeal din yun. Dapat ma-real-time tracking na itong mga to kasi kung puro post ano lang tayo, di ba anong ginagawa ng telco ngayon? 
reactive lang eh, block, 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 block. Walang re walang real time na pag may nakita nasaan 'yan, hanapin natin 'yan. Kailangang hulihin natin 'yang on-site. Hindi natin magawa 'yon kasi ni-repeal natin 'yung mga provisions na 'yon under the cyber crime law. Pero anyway, 'yung smart shaming, uh, of course there are a lot of reasons reason behind it. Pero I guess kasama na rin dun 'yung ano. Ano tingin niyo, what are for you? Why would you smart shame someone? Kasi 'di ba para yabang masyado no o kaya parang parang ano yabang mo naman na, na, nabasa mo lang naman yan <laughs> parang ganoon di ba parang uh, parang feed, parang i think there there is a way kasi na when you communicate you talk down on others no the moment na yung language na ginamit mo is like you're talking down rather than talking with others Ah, yun na, yun na. Doon na ang simula ng problema. So, so I think smart chain, para I don't want to judge na it's a culture thing. I think it's really more of a communication issue. Of course, not many will agree with me on that. Pero feeling ko, there's a problem with how you communicate. Kaya ganun siya. Parang di ba naging challenge yun ni President Duterte na panagsasalita siya dati, di ba? Iba yung dating niya pag nagsasalita. Merong talaga enamored sa kanya, pero merong iba na, yun, technically, parang sineshame siya no, with the way he talks. So, it's really a communication, parang feeling ko it's really a, a communication issue rather than dahil ayaw natin na may matalino nagsasalita. Kasi, like like right now, uh, President Bongbong Marcos, um, I believe he's a very uh, eloquent uh, communicator, no? Um, kaya niya mag-communicate ng issues, magbigay ng opinion niya, pero hindi mo parang pero hindi mo mararamdaman na he's talking down at you. Parang hindi mo mararamdaman na parang nagmamagaling siya, nagmamarunong siya, nagyayabang siya. Parang hindi ganoon yung dating ng pagsasalita niya. Pag nagsasalita siya parang para kaling, para kanya kinakwentuhan, di ba? Para kanya parang ini-explain niya sa iyo, kalma lang, no? Pero pero dahil interesting, nakikinig ka, no? So parang pero di ba, halos wala ka namang makita talagang umaatak, di ba? Maybe some people might say kulang sa ganito, kulang sa ganyan. Pero wala ka namang makikitang nilalait yung sinasabi niya. So kaya kaya I think we we have to rethink yung concept din ng uh, smart shaming, no? Uh, cancel culture, no? Isa rin niya sa mga na ano natin. Although nung early days hindi naman cancel culture tawag natin diyan, 'di ba? Ang tawag natin dati diyan ay ano, mob mob mentality, no? Um parang ika-cancel na kita, tatanggalin na kita. Uh, i, i, i ano na kita, i-remove na kita. Siguro term na lang natin 'yan ngayon, pero kasi 'di ba, from from a mental health perspective, If the pers if whatever the person is saying or whatever the person is doing is not helpful sa health mo sa mental health mo, you stay away from that person, di ba? We're reminded stay away from toxic people, stay away from negative people, stay away from this, stay away from that. If if we're gonna use modern terms, kung sa sabi ko stay away from toxic people, sabi ko ikancel mo yung mga toxic <laughs> kung gagamitin ko yung <laughs> slang na yon today no um parang uh, it's not because it's not because you don't want to learn more or you know siguro talagang for your own mental health sake ay, ayaw, ayaw mo na intindihin no kasi siguro sobrang confused na rin tayo sa mga kung ano-anong information na nakikita natin diyan um kaya 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 nangyayari yan sa atin today and to the point that we cancel certain people no kaya nga di ba sa politics a lot of us break connections uh, suddenly lose our friendship kasi wala na eh iba na eh Nag- nakikita mo hindi na align yung principles nyo hindi na align yung beliefs nyo and if those principles or beliefs are so important to you um, maybe you just want to talk with people that you like no But of course, it also presents another challenge on the flip side. Uh, to grow as human beings, kasi we have to have empathy and understanding of others. If we only want to listen to the things that we want to listen to and not learn about others, then parang hindi na tayo nag-go-go out ng ating comfort zone. No? Parang limited ka na lang. 
So, para na apektuhan yung pagiging open-minded natin. Pero siguro, uh, timing lang din. Kasi baka naman talagang masyado toxic yung times, times na yun. Na it's hard to be open-minded. Na to the point na pag in-entertain mo siya, instead of having a good effect on you, it might have a negative effect on your mental health. No? Uh, kaya, kaya tingin ko, dun ko mas nakoconnect siya. Now, Now, uh, ang isa rin nakikita rin natin, ang popular na examples sa cancel culture, yan, sa mga shaming na nangyayari, ay yung mga iba't ibang campaigns na nakikita natin online. di ba? Uh, if you remember when Shopee announced their newest endorser, nag, talagang marami nagalit kasi sabi nila, naku, bakit siya ang kinuha yung endorser? Hindi na ako magsashopping sa inyo. Talaga sobrang ayoko sa kanya. Uh, d- depende siguro no depende uh, i was wondering nga eh kung politiko yung naging endorser ng isang uh, website ganun din kaya ang magiging feeling so i guess kung napaka strong siguro ng personality napaka strong ng kanya mga opinions whether sabihin niya directly or express uh, indirectly Uh, pwedeng, pwedeng ganon or parang na, pwede rin naman sabihin natin na blame game din siya kaya ganon pero I think from from a branding perspective normally sa mga brands kapag naghahanap ng mga endorsers maraming criteria yung paghahanap ng endorsers and usually ang isa sa mga hinahanap mong endorser yung attractive sa nakaka-relate yung maraming audience segment no yun usually ang pinaka criteria natin kaya it was interesting kung paano siya na posi- kaya it was interesting para sa akin kung paano siya na position uh, uh, and there's a possibility rin na parang people will do business with people they like eh. so talagang nagustuhan siya siguro ng judging panel yung yung body na nag-endorse sa kanya kasi nakikita siguro na kahit na ano pa man ang opinion niya there are a lot of people who love her no as an as a as a celebrity um so yan siguro yung uh, pwedeng naging reaction sa kanya kayo ba na naapektuhan kayo ng ban naapektuhan ba kayo ng ban <laughs> oo So anyway, sige, uh, alam ko pa, para lumagpas na yata ako sa time ko, pero siguro i-emphasize ko lang na uh, influencers can can create a greater impact, no, sa mga paligid niya, no. You can you can be a source of chaos or you can be uh, a calm, no, amidst the storm. So as influencers Um, meron tayong ay sorry meron tayong responsibility na pwede, pwede natin gamitin yung powers natin yung connection natin yung influence natin uh, to foster uh, greater good kaya nga maganda, maganda yung nangyari do sa COVID-19 as a lot of influencers get together and uh, you know help out sa mga pangyayari no And marami rin tayong mga nakikita rin ng mga influencers who are speaking on issues, no? Like yung mga perspective nila on negative campaigning and going against it, uh, going against shaming, bashing of individuals just because they have a certain opinion. So nakita rin natin yan at uh, nagiging effective din sila. At meron ka rin mga nakikita mga personalities na without them being political and everything oh, pero of course naging political then later on si Doc Willie Ong no nag-decide na siyang mag-run for vice president pero kudutusin when you there are also personalities na talagang nag-rise above at talagang masyado silang nakilala dahil na rin sa passion nila no for educating the public yung yung greater cause greater advocacy of uh, promoting public health and to the point baka reach na certain pillar or certain accomplishment at yung accomplishment yung yun yun yung nag-pave the way para para makilala rin siya ng iba at mas makakonek pa sa kanya yung iba so there's too much competition online for influencers and also for brands to get attention and that is why a lot of them are turning to influencers para papansin sila Uh, pero marami namang ways no para ma-profile natin yung mga influencers kagaya ng binanggit ko sa kan- binanggit ko kanina and how we can work them pero kung kayo gusto niyo i-grow ang inyong influence uh, there are a lot of factors that will drive 
your the rise of your credibility as influencers or even checking your credibility na influencers but it's a combination of credibility yung reach ng influencer pati rin yung style ng influencer nakaka kanino yung style niya kaninong market ito mas nakaka-relate although madalas nandun sa A-list ang focus uh, ng mga high budgets pero if you have limited budget or even if you have a higher budget but if you want to have an expansive uh, blue footprint then long tail ang ginagamit natin kasi i uh, palagi ko sasabi diyan eh, i'd rather have 100 bloggers talking about you rather than have one super celebrity talking about you although i you can have a, a celebrity talking about you and then you have 50 bloggers commenting on what the celebrity said about you and add their thoughts so may may merong ibang way kung paano natin siya uh, pinagko-combine pero definitely uh, it's important not to keep influencers in the dark kasi usually yan yung pwede mag-trigger din kaya nagkakaroon ng mga uh, com mga conversations na unpleasant no at uh, miscommunication no at kung saan-saan pa napupunta all right so thank you so much for this uh, opportunity Media Civic Lab at sana nakatulong yung mga shiner ko sa inyo thank you thank you thank you ma'am Janet um ma'am before you leave let's entertain siguro some questions is ma'am Janet still here is Ma'am Janet? Sure, okay, sure. Ma'am Janet is still here. Pasensya ka okay. nag-gab ba? Nakerry the way ako sa mga kwento ko. <laughs> yeah, Alam actually, mo, I love that discussion. May check ako ng kwento. Sabi ko nga eh, napaka-tame ng kwento ko. Ang dami ko pang hindi kinikwento eh. Sabi ko, ang dami kong chike eh. Pag-uting dyan eh. Sige. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're gonna add you in your social media, Ma'am Janet. And they will actually launch all of those questions in your respective channels. No? But um, for, for our influencers here and content creators, feel free to drop your questions in our Zoom chat. Ma'am Janet, I want to start the question and answer portion. No? Um, there's been a lot of parang confusion over the role of influencers in the Philippine media landscape. For one, um, for example, kung ikaw nanonood ka ng show sa Netflix tapos naiinis ka sa isang character, one is the question about accountability. Like for example, you go to Reddit, you bash this, this person, this celebrity, because you just hate this person so much. But because there's no direct accountability, you can just troll or bash this person online. I will not see myself in prison cells because of that. People can get scot-free from bashing, from the cancel culture and things like that. But for the case of influencers, given the degree of influence they have, they should have a higher pedestal of accountability or certain level of accountability because they can influence a lot of people. So the question is, do you think the current process, if there is any form of accountability we're holding these influencers against, do you think the current process is enough or should we add more mechanisms to actually institute more filtering mechanisms over the the way they spew out their voices and opinions to the public. What's your take on that one? Alam mo kasi mahilig ako manood ng Netflix no. So, meron ako mga favorite at not so favorite na characters din diyan. Kung kung ang kini, kung ang kinikritik niya yung character do sa story, I guess that's okay. Ng ngayon, kung ang kinikritik niya yung celebrity for poor performance, like halimbawa talagang hindi niya nagustuhan yung performance sa celebrity. Ah, uh, tingin ko naman kahit na i-bash niya, for as long as the celebrity has followers, yung followers ng celebrity naman na yon pagtatanggol siya meron nga ako napanood ano ba to yung search www uh, na series na parang itox parang ang parang ang ira niya yung portals eh, yung labanan ng mga portals and it was a very interesting uh, series kasi it talks about government desire to access information of individuals etc etc pero anyway yung yung nakikita natin yung yung nung pinapanood ko siya sabi ko nga doon ko rin na realize na uh, if if kung kung gusto mo sumikat mangcriticize ka ng somebody that people love para hayaan mo pagpiestahan ka ng tao whether they like you or not pero definitely you will put you will be in anyone's radar parang pumunta ka sa Twitter bigla mong awayin ng BTS parigurado awayin ka ng BTS army pero makikilala yung account mo baka dumami ka agad followers mo <laughs> so so kaya kaya tingin ko kailangan uh, tingnan din natin yung intention behind it uh, diyan na papasok yung sila sabi lang uh, freedom of expression no <laughs> na na as, as a consumer you can bash now whether whether you're right or not nasa sa atin na yung mga individuals yung yung 
pag-assess kung valid ba yung sinabi niya o hindi. At kung hindi tayo nag-agree sa kanya, edi makipag-argue tayo sa kanya. Sabihin ko, ay, love ko yung karakter na yan. Bulag ka, hindi ka marunong mag-assess ng ganito. <laughs> Kaganoon ka na lang din <laughs> sa conversation para pagtanggol mo ang iyong, uh, pag, pagtanggol mo ang iyong celebrity. No? Parang yung ano, ano yung rap na may binanggit dito yung rappers? Yung nag rap kayo pero nagbabash kayo sa isa't isa. Pag nag rap kayo. Ano yun? Yung, ano tawag do sa rap na yun? Yung flip top, di ba? Yung flip top lang eh. Di ba grabe yung flip top eh? Kung ano-ano sinasabi, no? na, meron kasi kami family member na manood, maniling manood ng flip top. Pag nanood ka na, sabi ko, grabe to, talaga throw it out. Bahala ka, weather totoo yan. Yung nanay mo, ganito. <laughs> parang, I guess, at, at least kung alam mo na parang ingest siya, then, you know, you might be more toler- tolerant. No? Yeah. Um, there was even a saying from Corazon Aquino, Ma'am Janet, diba, na the best way to be relevant is to be straightforward. Anyway, um, we have a lot of questions here in the chat. Um, there is a question. It's a very lengthy question. How can we control ourselves in terms of being bothered by false information given by people who don't have access when it comes to receiving information from social media? I know it's about disinformation, Ma'am Janet, but what's your take on this one? Uh, usually, ang suggestion ko talaga, EPM. Let's not publicly shame. <laughs> Kasi mangyayari, misan pag mali, di ba, magkocomment tayo. Uy, wrong information yan. Para naalala ko dati, uh, that w- there was an election some time ago. Parang merong nambabash to a politician. And then, meron naman mga articles that already correct that. So, kasama yata ako doon sa nagreply sa kanya sa comments para sabihin, actually na correct na yang infor- mer- ano yan, parang wrong information yan. Ito na yung correct information. Check mo parang napaka casual lang na check mo. Alam mo yung person na nasabihan, parang talaga super offended siya, no? I think nang unfriend yata siya because of that, no? So so yung being bothered or not bothered, I don't think we should be We, we should I think we should uh, take care no lalo na kung if we care about the person uh, wag na lang yung da- care about the person and we don't want anyone correcting them and calling them out for spreading false information so ipm na lang natin siya at sabihin natin na na mali yung information na na-share niya ito baka makatulong to sa kanya um, and for most people naman as long as we talk to them properly they they appreciate it naman Uh, at least experience ko, ah, basta maayos yung pag-reach out natin ng, as long as we don't talk down. No? Basta yeah. talk with ang approach. Okay, let's jump to the very last question, Ma'am Janet. Uh, this is a question from Renzel. For those of us whose primary goal is to stop mis- and disinformation, what strategies of distribution beyond publishing might we consider? Kasi publishing, ang ginagamit kasi natin yung publishing to reach the masses, right? Um, yun, ang, yun ang reason behind it. Uh, pwede tayo mag ano, uh, one-on-one engagement. Uh, kasi kagaya sa akin, I have to admit, I'm more focused on direct engagement. Uh, for the past year. So, instead of parang posting something on social media, using the social media as a megaphone, I now use social media more as a telephone. <laughs> really talking to individuals one by one. So, kung ang goal natin is, kung, kung another strategy for distribution is by creating small groups of people. Yung nga lang, para mas matrabaho siya, pero kung kung ang if you really care about these people and you want to add value to them k- kasi part yun sa ano eh um, i'm gonna wear my my sales hat sa sales hat a little no normally if you if you want to build relationship with your customers and strengthen your relationship with your customers you should continuously add value so kung kung implement mo yung sa social media that means regularly reaching out or or kaya nakita-kita kayo sa isang event pwede may small group kapos parang nagsha-sharing sharing lang kayo without necessarily spamming um, each other no pero continuously add value so so kung that can be another way create your own small viber group create ka ng small mga ano mo several groups and then of course whatever you want to spread 
na tingin mo dapat malaman nila, ipuput natin into context on those respective groups para hindi naman tayo mukhang nag spam And hopefully, those small respective groups, para mga small packets of influence, uh, sila may word of mouth effect din sila at pwede rin sila mag-share to others. So, that can also be achieved as an effect. Uh, sa Facebook, pwede kang gumawa ng list. No? Yung parang pang may pinos ka, you want only a certain list of people to see it. No? I think nandun pa rin yata yung feature na yun. So, uh, pwedeng ganun din. Kaya lang, ang problem kasi yun sa timeline, parang hindi na siya basta-basta nakikita. Eh. So, talagang ano na ngayon, direct messaging na talaga sa, sa observation ko. Okay, uh, Ma'am Janet, uh, let's just give this uh, one participant the very last chance no, to ask the question, how can influencers be an agent to eliminate or lessen cancel culture and smart shaming? This is question from uh, Kent Andy. Alam mo, mahirap. Kasi personality yan eh. Kung, kung ang personality niya, why people get drawn to them. Parang yung, <laughs> parang yung there was a time na interview ako sa KMJS. Yung mga, yung mga gamers na nagsasayaw muna, nakalimutan ko na yung sayaw, kaldag. Nagkakaldag muna sila, nagsasayaw sila ng kaldag for 30 minutes before they start playing the game. And while they're dancing kaldag, dami ng dami ng tao yun nandun sa platform. Tapos pag naglalaro sila, may mga favorite flowery expression sila pag naglalaro sila. The puro tut, tut mga gano'n na maririnig mo kasi syempre puro mga anong mga words yun. No? Pero ang, tapos, ano, and then every once in a while, during the conversation, they were, gusto ko si ganito, ayoko sa kanya, ganito, ganyan, ganyan. So in a sense, parang nag-e-shaming na sila nun, di ba? Habang naglalaro na sila, may shaming na, may, may cancel culture na nag-happen kasi kung sino-sino na yung mga nababanggit nila mga tao um, in the process. Um, I think kung sino man yung mga personalities na yan, nasa smart, nasa smart shame o nakakans, yan, yung kailangan talaga, ano eh, um, I, for for the for the person i-reevaluate niya yung kanya paano siya nagko-communicate ngayon on the other hand dun sa mga tao alam niyo mahirap magsalita na sabi niyo uy wag naman tayong ganito wag naman tayong ganyan online etiquette hindi ganito yon hindi ganyan kasi kailangan din nating maintindihan saan nanggagaling yung audience natin for example whatever attitude they display let's say may nagsalita ng ganito galit na galit sila pag bakit ganung magsalita Maybe a lot of people grew up in an environment na na nilalait lait na ibang tao and they get so sick hearing somebody na para masyado nang nang mamagaling na para pa nagsalita sila nang lalait sila. So from an attitude perspective, maybe your attitude is like that because it was shaped and it was affected by people who might have treated you that way in your early childhood or you your teacher before or may na-meet ka before kaya para bang you grew up hating those type of people kaya pa nakita mo siya may na-manifest online at ngayon may power ka na to express yourself you're really gonna speak out speak out against it no uh, so so tama ba siya o mali siya doon sa ginawa niya mahirap sabihin kasi iba-iba ta yung for those of us who are more tolerant maybe um Maybe we see things differently. We have different experiences. But for those who have who have a different view, they may have different experiences. Kaya ganon ang ano nila. Kaya whatever whatever we're reacting to, uh, kadalasan uh, it has to it usually has connection to what happened to us in the past and why we may feel that way. So yun yung maganda malaman. Bakit, why do we feel that way? Parang yung, balikan ko lang ulit yung cybercrime law. Nung una mo pa sa yung cybercrime law, oh baka mamaya, oh, mabubura daw yung post natin sa Facebook, ganyan, 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 ganyan. Pero at the end of the day, the repeal of those provisions, it has only one root, uh, lack of trust sa law enforcement. Because one way or the other, a lot of people had bad experience with law enforcement. So yung past experience na yun, affected yung present perception do sa magiging enforcers ng law na okay sige fine dahil kailangan pa rin sila mag-enforce pero I'm not gonna entrust them to enforce this provision of real-time tracking dahil baka ako 
ma-abuse nila. I don't trust them. Kasi yung nabalitaan natin kung ano nangyari doon sa mga martial law, yung mga balita kung paano na-abuse yung mga rights. Pwede hindi tayo naka-get over with. Kaya ganun pa rin yung tingin natin sa kanila hanggang ngayon. It partly, hindi pa natin nalilet go yung mga ganung beliefs. So, kaya yung cancel culture, smart shaming, um, I think we have to go beyond the surface and really understand why do we feel that way? What have we experienced as, as citizens in the past? Yung sectors ng society natin, ano ba yung pinagdaanan nila na maaaring hindi natin na-experience kasi iba yung, iba yung stra, market, market strata natin sa market strata ng mga nagagalit. Para maintindihan natin sila. But of course, it's a different story kapag troll farms yun <laughs> na nanggugulo lang talaga. Yes, thank you so much from Janet. No, actually, just to add on that one, no, um, very important also to qualify um, whether cancel culture really is inherently bad per se. We also have to ask kasi it's also the wisdom of the crowd to assess as well whether they need or want a particular piece of information. And ang ganda ng mga sinabi ni Ma'am Janet, no? especially the natural check and balance mechanism as well. Like for example, if an influencer is espousing a lot of radical views, they will naturally lose a lot of followers as well. So there's also that kind of mechanism that they have to strike the balance in toning down or saying whatever ha- they have to say in the tone that is palatable to their audiences. Sa influencer culture at rule sa digital influencing at rule sa, sa branding, you have to stand out or don't bother. And if you're gonna use power as a communication medium para sa brand mo, para mag-stand out ka, you have to polarize your audience. Rule yun. Kasi pag hindi mo raw napopolarize ang audience mo, you're not being noticed. And the only way that you can really polarize is to go out there and be strong and put your foot down on something. And whether whether in the process by putting your foot down, you're canceling someone or you're shaming some, you're shaming someone in the process. Part yun, part yun doon, no? Para bang pag mo, I'm putting my foot down, I will never support anyone from this party. Cancel yeah. na sila sa akin. <laughs> Or uh, talagang mga lahat sila, mga ganyan sila, ganyan, 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 ganyan. In the process, parang you're shaming all of them, di ba? So, pero ano yun eh, kasama yun sa, kaya sa influencers, I think we have to be realistic. If you're trying to appeal to everyone, you're not gonna appeal. You're not, you're not appealing to anyone at all. Wala ka, wala ka talaga. Pero kung gusto mo makapag-create ng, ng crowd na talagang tight, talagang solid, then you have to polarize na talagang uh, you have to polarize. Talagang mag ano ka, be known, be known for something. You don't care f- sa mga hindi nag-agree sa'yo, pero you will serve those who will agree with you. Parang ganun. Yeah. One good case study for that is the case of Bianca Gonzalez. Now, she was recently bashed for having very few YouTube views, but she was also very strong in saying that her YouTube channel is not really for virality. It serves a certain purpose. So um, I do agree with you on the topic of um, polarizing um, Janet, and especially because of our um, influ- influencers and content creators here. They do relate to that, that you really have to serve the very specific niche audience. Now, let's flash the certificate and let's uh, read a citation. Everybody think let's um, uh, this certificate of appreciation is proudly presented to Mom Janet Toral for sharing her invaluable knowledge and expertise on the influencer phenomenon on the digital age during the Media Civics Lab live masterclass on December 3, 2022, given this third day of December from 1 to 4 p.m. in Manila, Philippines, signed by yours truly, the founder and president of Break the Fake Movement. Thank you so much, from Janet. I'm pretty sure our participants here learned a lot from you on this topic about influencer phenomenon. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us in the first live masterclass. We're pretty sure, we're very hopeful that you learned a lot in today's masterclass on the topic, Responsible Digital Citizenship. Hopefully, you're more confident about being digital citizens and also share knowledge to other people within your areas of influence about digital citizenship. Now, please don't forget to sign up the evaluation form and post test that we will be flashing on the screen at the end of this class. We will also be sending those links out in a Viber, Messenger, and Facebook groups. But before you can do that, if you haven't joined those groups, 
please do so so you can have access to those links. Most importantly, do not forget to join the second live masterclass happening next week, December 10. We will post more information in the next few days. You can actually block out the entire schedule for the live masterclasses until the second week of January. Again, thank you so much for attending this first live masterclass session on responsible digital citizenship. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. Good afternoon and see you next week.